who wants to start the new year with a serving of cinematic snacks? Hi, it's Alicia from Wool Shift Dust and the Lore Hounds, here to tell you about the AODR Film Festival's third edition, January 4th to 24th, 61 short films across five categories, including Oscar-eligible shorts. Your votes will determine which films win the Audience Awards, and since the event takes place online, it's accessible anywhere. And with a price point of $4.99, it's also an ideal stocking stuffer for the film lovers in your life. Discover new bite-sized cinema this January. There's something for everyone, from moving documentaries on dying cultures, to avant-garde animation, to dark comedies, heart-wrenching dramedies, and everything in between and beyond. Find out more on aodr.net slash festival. That's aodr.net slash festival. See you there. And welcome to a very happy holiday edition of Wool Shift Dust. I'm Luke and I'm no, sorry, you're I'm, Alicia. Alicia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm leaving it. <laughs> yeah, you're Alicia, I'm Luke. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> and we are celebrating the festive season with an in-depth dive into a holiday favorite, the OG alternate reality tale, It's a Wonderful Life. And the multiverse of I wish I'd never been born ripoffs, I, I mean tributes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna spend um we're gonna spend most of this episode focusing on It's a Wonderful Life. You know, this is like the iconic film. And I've got some it, yeah, fun background information about how it was made and the legacy that it's had and why. Um, but then we're going to be branching out for some laughs and look at how the same source material enters into the cultural psyche and then is combined and recombined over the decades. We watched six films in total to prepare for this, so we'll run through all of them at least briefly. Um, and yeah, that means spoilers for an 80-year-old movie are incoming. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, also for some of the twists and turns of the movies that are based on that story. So these are movies that you may or may not ever have even heard of and probably never want to watch. But the one we will not spoil until the end is the brand new movie, It's a Wonderful Knife, which is the horror parody that came out this year. We'll, we'll give you a spoiler warning for that one and we'll save it till the end because uh, we want to give people time to watch it if they want to. And yeah, we got... Um, just FYI, we got some feedback on Twitter and Discord and Reddit, but there's not going to be a separate feedback section this time. We're just going to be working those responses in where relevant. So, Luke, you this was your first time watching It's a Wonderful Life. I have to ask, uh, are you a fan of older black and white movies in general? Yeah, because this is what I was thinking, because I've never watched It's a Wonderful Life. This is the first time I've watched it. Um, and like, I did wonder whether my reaction was conditioned by like being told it's a classic, it's a brilliant film, it's right. it's this, it's that. But on the other hand, um, you know, I watched Casablanca a couple of years ago, and that lives up to every expectation you could have of it. You know, it's a okay, it's a, it's a wonderful film. Um, oh, see, so, I prefer this one to Casablanca personally. Okay, okay. Well, I, well, I rewatched that recently too re when, before I went to Morocco. Okay. Um, so I don't watch a lot of black and white movies, but what I found mm -hmm. fa what I found fascinating about this was just how much I already knew of the movie, despite having never right. watched it. Like mm -hmm. the extent to which it has just leaked out into the world, like the whole scene with the bank run. I recognize that from a Simpsons episode. The whole where he's running through the um, streets of Bedford Falls at the end. Right. Um, I recognize that. Obviously, I re there's a reference to the Newell Post in. Uh, in my actual favorite Christmas movie, National Lampoon's oh, okay. uh, Christmas yeah. Vacation, where he fixes a new post by sawing it off. Yeah, so it was it was really quite startling how much I already knew of the movie, despite having never watched it. Yeah, so I, I've been talking to a lot of people in prepping this episode about this film, and it is interesting. You know, you brought up that you thought it might be, you were talking with your British friends about how this might be like sort of an American cultural phenomenon. 
And I was talking to my friend Rain from Mexico. Uh, she was saying that, you know, movies, this movie is like known in Mexico, but it's not really a classic and people may know the name, but they really don't like watch them. And my friend fr who grew up in Poland said that she's never heard of it at all. So yeah, it made me want to post. I, I don't know if you saw, I posted a couple polls on Twitter to ask people to weigh in on whether or not they knew the movie and how well, and whether they thought it was an American or international phenomenon. So, ooh, 22 minutes left on the first poll. And 43.6% um, said that they have seen It's a Wonderful Life. 26.9% said that they've heard of it. 16.7% say that it's one of their favorites. And 12.8% say that they've never heard of it. I mean, Will, the friend you refer to, said it's an American thing. But actually, mm -hmm. I don't think that it is because there's an art house cinema near my parents that shows it every year. Like, I've had the opportunity to go and see it. It's a yeah. wonderful life. I've just, never, I've just never gotten around to it. I don't think it is quite as prevalent in the UK. Mm -hmm. as the US, but it's certainly a, a well-known film. I think if you want the UK equivalent of It's a Wonderful Life, it's probably the version of A Christmas Carol with Alistair Sim from the, the right. th about the same time. No, that makes sense. These films are, are well-linked too. I mean, these, these stories are well-linked. We'll talk about that also as we go. But um, yeah, I did also ask a follow-up question about whether it's international or American. And so then we got... 70.3% said that it was an American classic, 15.6% said it an international classic, 10.9% said that they didn't know it, and 3.1% said it was niche. So we're leaning American, but uh, there was an interesting conversation kicked up under that um, where we have uh, Nynaeve Sedai, who's Irish, and uh, Charlie, who's from the southeast of England. And Nynaeve was saying that I I went with International, uh, one of my OH's favorite Christmas films. What does OH mean? Other half. Oh, no. I, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah there we go. One of, one of my other half's favorite Christmas films growing up, and he had the TV channels in Scotland as a kid. It was always on my TV at Christmas along with Gone with the Wind, and I grew up associating it with St. Stephen's Day. Interesting. What's St. Stephen's Day? I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have no idea. I think this is an Irish thing rather yeah. than a... Or maybe Scottish, than yeah. a UK um, thing. And so, yeah, but Charlie said, uh, from South e Southwest England, sorry, born in the 80s, I watched, it on, I watched it on purpose in my 20s because I'd heard a lot about it from Americans. It was not a naturally occurring phenomenon in me. And, but then they went on to discuss that, um, that it might be just based on how much you watched black and white films growing up. Like if you watch black and white films, you watch this film. If you did not grow up with that being, you know, part of the cin cinematic catalog that you watch, then yeah, you probably miss this one too. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we also, some feedback that we got on Twitter was uh, Mark Ansani said, it's a beautiful holiday movie. Watch it every year. And I'm surprised by these numbers, but I'm American. So maybe that's why, but it's just a very wholesome, feel good movie. And I cry every time. Uh, and on the other hand, a random thread in the pattern said, I know of it, but I've never bothered to sit and watch it. So it seems like that's the majority of people. And Dead Eye Jedi Bob says, I've only seen it around three times over the years. I still enjoy it, though. I'd say it's pretty high up on my list of Christmas favorites, even though I haven't seen it as many times as my parents. I know a great deal more about it now, thanks to you. And he's referring to the fact that he and I worked together on the greatest gift audio drama of the story on which this is based. So, okay, so we're establishing it's maybe American, seems a lot of British people at least are aware of it, but maybe not everywhere. It seems the, the more you are connected to American or classic film culture, the more likely you are to have this be a part of your... Yeah, I, th I think that that sounds about right to me. Yeah. So why are we talking about this story? Well, first of all, it's the biggest alternate timeline in the cultural zeitgeist. You know, everything, every time they do an alternate timeline, it's either this movie or sliding doors that people refer to. But yeah, I think Davy Mack's story, um, which he shared with me on, on Discord, resonates here. He said, my first memory of this film was a short bit you see in Home Alone dubbed in French. My second memory was having a VHS tape of Dana Carvey's best SNL skits and the lost ending uh, to It's a Wonderful Life was on there. 
And <laughs> that naturally skewed my sense of what the movie was. Uh, content warning around insensitive language and depiction of disability, if you do look it up on YouTube. Uh, three, I became obsessed with The Big Lebowski in high school and was convinced that The Big Lebowski character was inspired by Mr. Potter. The Coens, after all, made their own Capra movie in the Hudsucker Proxy. And I don't remember when I first saw the film itself, but I had all these misperceptions around it based on how just how much it was riffed on in the culture. So this is similar to what you were saying, Luke. But I eventually saw it and really liked it. A buddy of mine in college had it as one of his favorite movies, so we tried to make a yearly tradition of it, but it didn't stick after college. And I've got this weird ambivalence around Christmas movies, despite my love of Christmas, so I haven't sought it out in years. And I should mention that Davy Mack um, grew up in the U.S., but has lived in Japan for a long time. So we talked about maybe that plays a role in that, too. Okay. So, yeah, but I've also heard it's like hugely ambivalent responses. There's people online who have said that this film, this film fills them with existential dread. Um, I wouldn't say existential dread, but I do know where they're coming from. But I would dispute that that film has a happy ending. Okay, yeah. That's yeah. That's that's what uh, some people find it depressing, you know, that George never gets to lead the life he wanted traveling the world. But I think to other people, it's like it's a comfort that you can feel your life still has enormous value, even if it didn't turn out the way that you planned for yourself when you were young. Although I have to say in the original short story that the film's based on, George is more of an everyman rather than like a pillar of the community. So I think that also changes it too. You know, George's depression looks more like most people's depression in this, in this story. Okay. But yeah, overall, I, I guess it depends what you take out of it. Uh, oh, some more feedback we got from at Not Shaken Child on Twitter is, yeah, It's a Wonderful Life is one of my favorite Christmas movies. It's a feel-good story. Good and community trumps evil capitalism. And George and Mary's romance is sweet. There's just one problematic scene. George's uh, brother with maid while they have dinner. I don't like it. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's 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 of its time. It's mm-hmm. of its time. Let's mm-hmm. put it that way. Yeah. But yes, it's deeply problematic. Yeah. So the Annie the maid was played by Lillian Randolph, but I did notice that that character wasn't in any others. But then also you end up having no characters of color in the other films. A lot of them. So that's like also an issue. But uh, and this is, I have to say, yeah, of its time, I do love this film still, but um, there are some sexist things said in a way that's not portrayed as negative. And there's also, they sing a minstrel song throughout, which is dropped in other versions. So, yeah. Yeah. Acknowledging, the, the, moving on. <laughs> the the bit that sort of stuck out for me when it's like, it's the idea that Mary is a, spin, you know, this um, spinster maiden aunt when she'd be about 27, 28, mm-hmm. something like that. And, you know, yeah, exactly. And George goes, how old are you? 18. And it's like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> proposals at 18. Well, I guess she's old enough to give consent. I guess, yeah, that's true. I guess that, that's something. But whoa. Hmm. <laughs> So Not Shaken Child, by the way, also weighed in on the American question and said, I lean American. The reason why I watched uh, classics like this when I was younger was because of the TCM, the Turner Classic Channel we had on cable. So yeah, that makes sense. This is definitely a Turner Classic movie kind of thing, except we'll talk later about how you'll only find it on NBC channels. (laughs) So, but I think Not Shaken Child does touch on what a lot of people feel is that it's a very hopeful film. And, you know, George's that it's it's a film that reminds you of your values and and George Bailey's father he had that motto all you can take with you is that which you have given away so yeah it, it's it is it's not really the most christmasy christmas film but it does have like that sort of spirit of giving in there yeah and yeah i just wanted to cite one more piece of, of feedback to start off just because my friend heather summarized so well exactly why i wanted to cover this She said, so I've been thinking about this since you sent it. This was one of my grandpa's favorite movies, and I know he watched it, but I didn't really remember anything specific. And for a long time, I just thought I'd never actually seen it. Then I watched it as an adult a few years ago, and I realized there were a couple of scenes that had been living in my mind since childhood that I hadn't realized were from that movie. The bank run and the gym floor opening up to reveal a pool underneath. I didn't remember the mental health crisis aspects of it at all. As an adult, though, those were the parts that stood out to me the most. But I think it's kind of interesting. The parts of the movie that really stuck with me, that clung to my little brain and formed core memories that remained, 
long after even the memory of watching the movie faded were the happy parts. As an adult, though, I clung on to the sad bits, the depression, the suicidal desire, and it made the movie very painful for me to watch for a few years. But in time, I was able to put those two feelings together, and now I see it as this beautiful mosaic of the rawest, both good and bad, of the human experience. And I think the way my adult brain wanted to only hold on to the dark parts, completely ignoring the joyous moments that child me so loved, feels a lot like the journey George is going through. I don't know if that's what you're looking for. Yes, it was very much so. Uh, but it's been nice to think about now. I want to rewatch. I really think this whole aspect is why the movie has remained in the public mind for so long. It feels so ahead of its time in a lot of ways. And it's still so incredibly rare to see a holiday movie go. Yes, things can be good, but things can be bad in such a meaningful way that respects the weight of mental health struggles. So, yeah. What do you think, Luke? Yeah, I mean, that that's a, that's a very good. That's a very good review of the film. I mean, I I didn't get all of that out of it, but I can see like I can see how somebody would get all of that out of it. Maybe uh, it does take repeat viewing. Yeah, and it's um it is a very sort of it's it's a film that doesn't shy away from the dark parts of human nature and the mental he- mental health crisis. And I think actually in a lot of ways that's what kind of grounds the film and makes it work because I found it quite alienating to watch in this in some senses just because it is a it's a period piece so you know the, mm-hmm. some of the language is a bit antiquated mm-hmm. and it's, there are parts of it that are a bit hokey and a bit right. Hollywood but yeah the, the strength of Jimmy Stewart's performance mm-hmm. and the fact that it doesn't shy away from the full horror of what George is facing towards the end of the film does kind of ground it. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Heather put to words exactly a lot of my feelings. And I'm also surprised to be reminded of the, like some scenes and ideas that live in my head because of this film, but I kind of forget about it. Like, for instance, I went through a phase as a kid that actually, I say as a kid, but it lasted for a really long time, where I would tie red strings to my fingers to remember things. And I'm, as I'm watching this film, I'm like, oh, right, that is where I got it from. <laughs> it's because Uncle Billy does that. I, I guess the other big question we have to discuss is like, is this a Christmas story? I'm calling this the winter holiday special because, you know, I want to leave this format open to whatever in coming years, but this one, yeah, it has Christmas take place in it. Um, but I would call it personally, barely a Christmas story. What what do you think? It's it's not, it's not a Christmas film, but Mm -hmm. it has like Christmas themed elements running throughout it you know the importance of family community it's a very very judeo-christian movie right i am i like because i i did in the research for this i found out it's on one like it's on like the vatican's list of recommended movies oh really and (laughs) yeah it was it was it was one of pope john paul ii's favorite movies okay and you can definitely see why this is a very very judeo-christian film um and there's no, there's nothing wrong with that it's just it wears its religiosity on its sleeve in a way that well, i don't yeah. have a lot of modern movies wouldn't yeah okay but so i have to say that the the author of the original short story the greatest gift um he's he was half jewish um half christian you know he was his father was jewish his mother was christian and both he and the film director Frank Capra were quoted as saying that Christmas wasn't really an important part of this film. It just was like incidental, the setting. But I have to say the movie did versus the story. They added prayers and that angel element. Whereas in the short story, it's the guy's just called the stranger and you don't really know what his deal is. But they took out the church going references, which I think was just like, you know, it's Christmas. People went to church in 1940 when this was written. Yeah. But only in the film, only the first scene and like the final quarter actually take place during Christmas. Yeah, um, that that was that. It one of the things that did surprise me is just how long it took for yeah, uh, just how long it, how deep into the movie you have to get before you get to the bit where George Bailey wishes he was never born. Yeah, that's, I, that's, I, that's I knew how that, the short knew, story starts. Yeah, okay, because I, I knew that was coming because I, I vaguely knew what the plot was, but you're. Good. You're more than two thirds of the way through the movie by the time that. Yeah, but for the religiosity question, just I just have to quote two more people that both have differing, interesting responses to this. Uh, so, 
Birmingham City University criminology professor David Wilson wrote in The Guardian that he pops open a bottle of wine and watching watches the movie without his family every year because it is the closest an atheist can get to heaven. Wilson called it the least religious but most humanist film you could ever see. But on the other hand, Anne Morse wrote in the Christian Post, the movie is a magnificent cinematic depiction of the world of Jesus. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Matthew 16, 26. So, yeah, I just think it's interesting that uh, both atheists and religious people can see themselves and say, this is a film for me. Well, this is the thing. I think both of those opinions are basically right. Mm-hmm. Because you can believe in Judeo-Christian morality without without necessarily having to believe in the, the the sort of supernatural elements of it. If you don't, you know, you can accept that the Bible gives you a fairly good moral co- moral compass by which to live without interpreting it as being literally true. Mm-hmm. So I, I think both of those interpretations can live quite comfortably side by side. To be honest, and I think that's yeah. the. That's one of the strengths of the film. It's like any great film, you get out of it what you put into it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, just just to share where I'm coming from, in case anyone's curious, I um, I've personally always celebrated Christmas, but I had a family that was like a bunch of religions growing up, um, you know, especially like Orthodox and Jewish. Um, but I'm agnostic, uh, not really Christian. I, I believe things when there's evidence for or against them and leave my mind open to other possibilities otherwise. Okay, I mean, just to, to lay my cards on the table, I'd say I'm culturally Methodist because mm-hmm. um, my, par- Methodist. My, pa- yeah, my parents aren't particularly religious, but my grandparents on my dad's side were, mm-hmm. um, and I spent a lot of time with them growing up. So I can see a lot of that worldview and a lot of, that, a lot of the attitude that, that have rubbed off on me in the way I see the world. And I did go to, I wasn't a regular attendee at church as a child, but I did always go at Christmas. Right. Just because I knew, I knew even as a little kid that that was the, that that was the best present I could give my grandparents. That they would would really, (laughs) that they would really appreciate that. So we did go at Christmas. Hmm. And yeah, I'd say, I'm saying very much sort of culturally Christian, but, Probably agnostic in terms of belief. Yeah. I mean, we went occasionally at Christmas, but it was like, it wasn't, it definitely wasn't for my grandparents because the grandparents who were most present was, you know, one was Russian Orthodox and the other was Jewish. So they're like, I don't know, we don't care. <laughs> um, okay. So we're go- we're going to get into the movies themselves. But first I have to ask you, Luke, I asked you if you would think about your ranking for the six movies that we watched. And this is how we're going to introduce exactly what we're going to be talking about. So please tell us, out of the six movies that we watched, which was your least favorite film? Well, I don't think this is going to come as a galloping shock to you, Alicia, but it's, <laughs> we've got to start Clarence. <laughs> okay. So Clarence is a 1990 ostensible sequel. <laughs> oh, jeez. Your, yeah, your response to that film made me laugh so much. I can't wait to talk about it. It's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. But that's not my worst. Um, my number six, can you guess? You're going to say The Muppets, are It's you? The Muppets. It's it's a very merry, what is it? It's a very merry Muppet It's a, it's a very Muppet Christmas. Right. <laughs> no, that was just painful for me to sit through. I ended up speeding it up halfway through. Okay, I, I want to clarify, is it? Is it that you don't like that particular film or you just don't like The Muppets generally? I'm not a huge fan of The Muppets. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Luke is making faces. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not like the Muppets? I know. <laughs> My heart is dead inside. I like other Jim, Jim Henson stuff. You know, like I really love um, Dark Crystal and and Labyrinth. And, you know, I don't know. It's just the Muppets, like the humor never appealed to me. I just, their charms are lost on me. Bah humbug. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So number five for me is, yeah, it's going to be Clarence. What's your number five? Number five for me, I think, is going to be uh, It Happened One Christmas, the 1977 remake. Oh, you were considering you might like it better than the original. I I thought about it, but Mm -hmm. I thought about it. And then after, on reflection, I thought, why does this film exist? (laughs) It's a shot for shot remake. 
back of oh, It's uh, a Wonderful very Life. Very close, very, yeah. For mm-hmm. large parts of it. And I, I, I like Marlo Thomas's performance. And mm-hmm. because I knew the beats of the plot by that point, I wasn't as surprised by it as I was by It's a Wonderful Life. But ultimately, it just seems kind of pointless and vacuous. Because it's not just a, it's not a reimagining. It's not a retelling of the story. It is a show. Well, I mean, they gender swapped it at least. That yeah, I mean. they, and they, there they, are. They, we'll talk about the differences, but there are differences. Yeah, but I can't kind of get over the fact that it just seemed a little bit pointless at the end of the day. Okay. Um. So, what's your number four? Number four was the Muppets. Okay. Um. Right. I am. Uh, I do like the Muppets. I am. Mm-hmm. I am a Muppets fan. But yep. you show me a Muppets Christmas film, I'm just going to be asking why am I not watching a Muppets Christmas Carol? Yeah, like so that's it. Every time I bring this film up to anyone, they're like, "Just watch a Muppets Christmas Carol." Like, no, you're missing the point of the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Muppet. They did. They did. A, they did the perfect Christmas movie for the Muppets, and it was a Christmas Carol. Mm-hmm. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay, so my number four is going to be um, the the Christmas spirit. The 2013 Hallmark movie starring Nicolette Sheridan. And I liked it. Um, nothing against it. It's like very Hallmark, very Christmas. Uh, it, yeah, it was fun. N- nothing against it. Yeah, that's that's going to be my number three. Um, okay. I, I, you know, it, it, like you say, it's a Hallmark movie. It does what it says yeah. on the tin. There is nothing, there is nothing all unexpected about that. But I did kind of, I did kind of laugh at it because the plot is kind of preposterous. And I do love the fact that the entire basis of the film is this town is really struggling and everybody, it's a deep economic depression and everybody looks like they live in Narnia. Like they all have (laughs) these massive houses and the streets are perfectly clean and all the shops are wonderful. It's like, no, 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 no. This is not what an economically depressed town looks like. They were, uh, you know, piggybacking on those Nicola Sheridan, Desperate Housewife vibes. Yeah. Yeah. But I just, I love the fact, you know, we've got a nurse, a soldier and a small town newspaper editor all living in a mansion. You know, personally, yeah. the, the head cannon I came hey, up with. Hey, real estate is cheaper there. That's why they want to <laughs> get out the real estate developer. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And also, like, also, I think that film would have worked much better as a horror film. Okay. <laughs> the idea that they're commun- the idea that they're communicating whilst in a coma. You know, I expected an exorcism. I expect- yeah. <laughs> I just love the way the entire town just accepts this as. Perfect. Yeah. No, that was that. That was one of the weirdest ones, but I did like it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but my number three, yeah, I guess my number three is going to be, um, and it was a toss up between, cause I rated them the same on letterbox, my number three, my number two, but I think my number three is going to be, it happened one Christmas, which it did a weird thing where it made me, I appreciated that film more than I expected to, but it also made me love the original more for some reason it managed to it's like casting a new perspective on the original that made me appreciate aspects of it even more. So, um, yeah, I, I quite, I quite like that. But then I had to give my number two spot to it's a wonderful knife, the 2023 slasher comedy ode to it's a wonderful life. What about you? What's your second? My second is it's a wonderful life. Okay. Okay. Um, I like I watched I watched it a while ago actually now and it's kind of sort of settled in my brain. My initial reaction was not all that positive. But I right. think a lot of that was because it wasn't what I expected it to be. I think you're right. It, having watched it happened one Christmas, I came to like the original much better. Mm. Um because I'd ex- I'd expected the film to I'd expected It's a Wonderful Life to get to the point much quicker than it did. Okay. Watching it the first time, I felt it sort of ambled around a bit. Um, and the period issues bothered me right. um, more on first watching. But I think I think once you once you sort of appreciate that that, that is the plot, that is what it is. Yeah. Um, I liked it much better on reflection. Okay. Well. Uh, my number one is just, yeah, I'm being obvious here, but I'm giving it to It's a Wonderful Life. It's, it's, you know, rewatching it, I actually enjoyed it more than I expected to in this rewatch because I do have, you know, like Heather was talking about before, there are these tinges of anxiety and depression that are wrapped up in it. 
but that just kind of made me love it all the more. And it is the only one, and it does consistently make me cry at the end. Um, so yeah, m- my number one is going to be "It's a Wonderful Knife," mm-hmm. um, and that uh, and that really surprised me because I don't like slasher films as a general rule. I do, I, right. it's not it's not a genre of film I appreciate. But I thought the way they did that was, I thought they did something really clever with the central conceit of both slasher films and It's a Wonderful Life. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought it was actually much better acted than a lot of slasher films I've seen. And it does a really weird thing whilst being a horror, whilst being a a genuine slasher film. It's also kind of sweet and uplifting Mm -hmm. and the ending is, yeah, the ending makes you, makes you feel just really good about the world. Okay. Yeah, well, obviously, you and I both liked it. But as I said, we're, that's going to be the last one that we discuss. And we're going to save all spoilers on that one until the end uh, because it's brand new. But yeah, you know, reviews are mixed. But I think like you just have to go in embracing it's a silly slasher film and then you can really enjoy it because within that subgenre, it's 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 a good one. Yeah, it I, is. I said that it's a it's of like the Christmas horror films that I've watched in the past few years it's the one that i'm most eager to revisit probably yeah i can see that being a regular christmas film for me much more than yeah. probably it's a wonderful life to be honest okay no that's fair well yeah much more it was made 80 years later so yeah <laughs> well let's get into it's a wonderful life itself um we'll be right back to break that down tell you all about yeah all the juicy production details right after this quick commercial break Okay, so It's a Wonderful Life was based on the 1943 short story, The Greatest Gift by Philip Van Doren Stern. And yeah, again, like I said, this is a story we cover in the book club holiday special. So you'll find that link in the show notes. I'll talk about the full backstory of how this story was created, how it started its life as a 20 page Christmas card. Plus, you'll find a full audio drama reading with the help of Dead Eye Jedi Bob. And yeah, the, this short story was itself loosely based on A Christmas Carol by Dickens, of course. Both are stories of one or more spirits coming back to give a soul who's lost his way a deeper look into the consequences of their actions. And with A Christmas Carol, it's the spirits trying to instill regret into their subject. And in It's a Wonderful Life, the angel's trying to remove regret. Would you agree with that, Luke? Yeah, I think I think that's more or less right. I'm not sure he's trying to instill regret in Scrooge. It's just, just trying to make him well, see, change his ways. By yeah, just trying to make him change his ways. By how? Well, I always thought by sort of making him see that human contact was worthwhile. But I guess it is instilling a bit of regret as well. Because yeah, I mean, I yeah. always figured that's what the ghost of Christmas past is. Well, yeah, this is what you lost. This yeah, is what that's you're missing true. now. This that's is what true. you could miss in the future. But yeah, you can definitely see, though, this is the singular, in the original story, it's just called The Stranger, and it's just like this sort of mysterious spirit who clearly has some sort of supernatural powers because he keeps appearing and disappearing and knows things, but otherwise, we don't know what kind of being this is. But yeah, so RKO Pictures, the producer, David Hempstead, he came across this story, The Greatest Gift, and he showed it to Cary Grant. And the two of them decided it needed to be a movie. So it was originally going to star Cary Grant instead of Jimmy Stewart. But RKO, they originally purchased the, the rights for 10000 in 1944. But after they took a few stabs at a script, RKO ended up selling the rights in 1945 for the same price to Frank Capra's production company. Though Frank Capra uh, said that he paid 50 k But yeah, his production company, Liberty Films, adapted the story And it became It's a Wonderful Life. It was released in 1946 with Jimmy Stewart in the lead role and Donna Reed as his other half, Mary. Are you familiar with Frank Capra? Yeah, I am familiar with. I'm familiar with some of Frank Capra's work. I have to say mostly the stuff he did during the Second World War as basically a propagandist for for the American government. And some of the combat footage he um, he filmed, but... Yeah, I'm right. basically familiar with that part of his work, but not so much either before or after the Second World War. I mean, his most iconic work other than this film was from before the war. So he's an Italian-American um, famous uh, filmmaker, and he made films like It Happened One Night in 1934, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. These are names that might ring a bell. But then, yeah, he went 
and joined the war effort. And they made him make, you know, they had him make these propagandist films because that's his expertise. And It's a Wonderful Life was the first film that he made when he got back. And it was also the first film for Jimmy Stewart, who was wasn't even sure he was going to go back into acting. And Frank Capra was like, "Can be in this film." Yeah, I do know the Jimmy Stewart side of the story because actually I, I read about it fairly recently. So Jimmy Stewart is uh, Jimmy Stewart is a bona fide war hero mm. um, of the Second World War. Tell us more. So he um, he'd, he'd been a pilot in the 1930s. He'd had a civilian pilot's license in the 1930s. Um, and so uh, pretty much as soon as the Second World War breaks out, he volunteers to join what was then the Army Air Corps, what's now the U.S. Air Force. Um, the Air Force is more than happy to have a famous actor aboard, but right. they want him to do, they want him to do propaganda. They want him to do, they want him to do training movies rather like some of his contemporaries. Probably the most famous example is Ronald Reagan, mm-hmm. uh, who did that. By the way, did you know that Ronald Reagan discovered Marilyn Monroe? No, I didn't. So I found this out the other day. So Ronald Reagan was in charge of a cinema and photographic unit within the U.S. Army. And the the U.S. government wanted um, a new photograph for the Rosie the Riveter character. Okay. And one of the people they looked at was an 18-year-old Norma Jean Baker. Okay. Um, And yeah, so Ronald Reagan... Kind of discovered Marilyn Monroe. In a way. Okay. Bit of an aside there. But anyway, so Jimmy Stewart goes to Europe. He does one press conference for the Air Force and then says, basically, I want to be a combat pilot. If you don't let me be a combat pilot, I'm just going to go off and moan and whinge and bitch to the press, basically. So they let Jimmy Stewart be a combat pilot. He's assigned to a B-17 bomber group. And over the course of the war, he actually rises to command a bomber group. He's mm-hmm. awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, which is like the third highest medal for gallantry mm. um, that you get. He's involved. The reason I read the story is that he's involved in um, a series of heavy bombing raids called Big Week at the beginning of 1944, which is the height of the the, the European bomber offensive. He He actually leads one of the initial... One of the sort of first wave of U.S. bombers over Schweinfurt, which is a major ball bearing factory in Germany. And Jimmy Stewart comes home with what we would now call a pretty severe case of PTSD Mm -hmm. um, because he's seen a lot of his friends killed. Yeah. He's seen men under his command killed. And so, like you say, he's not sure he's going to go back into go back into acting. He thinks about staying in the Air Force. thinks about just sort of taking some time out and figuring out what to do next. And by the way, he does stay in the Air National Guard right the way through to Vietnam. He actually really? uh, he actually retires from the California Air National Guard as a brigadier general. But he general. doesn't serve abroad again, does he? He does. He trains pilots stateside okay. for the Korean War. Mm-hmm. Um, and he does go over to Vietnam in the 60s, but that's just really as a, a publicity uh, okay. junket. So, yeah, he's not sure quite what to do. So, like you say, Frank Capra basically calls him up and pretty much begs him to be in this new film Mm. um, that he's putting together. Yeah, and it's also, so Frank Capra, this film is really his baby um, to the detriment of many of his personal and professional relationships, it seems. So when he bought the film, he bought it along with, they they threw in the three scripts that they had tried before they gave up on the film. And he ended up taking elements from each of them and blending them together. For instance, one version had George Bailey as an idealistic politician who grows more cynical as the story progresses and then yeah, tries to kill himself after losing an election. And the angel shows him that Bedford Falls would be better if he had gone into business rather than politics. Now, I'm glad they didn't go that route, actually. I'm, I'm kind of on Frank Capra's side for this. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think that would have quite communicated the same the same message. I think that would have been a much more cynical, much more hard edged film. Yeah. I'm glad they didn't yeah. go that route. Yeah. I mean, in this version, as it turns out, it stays much truer to the spirit and content of the source material, but there was some kerfuffle over the writing credits. So ultimately it was credited as screenplay by Francis Goodrich, Albert Hackett and Frank Capra with additional scenes by Joe Swearling. So 
Goodrich and Hackett uh, were a married couple, and they apparently hated working with Capra, who they just said would just rewrite everything they did anyway. And Swearling was a friend of the couple, and they felt betrayed that he worked with Capra to rewrite their script. But then he felt, Swearling felt betrayed by being snubbed in the credits a bit. So he, he was additional scenes and not screenplay by. And so none of them ever talked to Frank Capra again after this. And he also fell out with the film's composer after refusing to use the music he commissioned for two scenes because he decided those scenes just shouldn't have any music. And the composer felt like his he wasn't being taken seriously. So yeah, he had a lot of problems like this working with people, it seems like. But he was passionate about making this film a very exact way. Does that make you like the film more or less? To know that about I don't think it makes me like the film more or less. I just no. find it kind of ironic that a film that, that's so centered on friendship and community and togetherness <laughs> has all this drama going on in the background. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it was it was definitely it came out at a time right after the war when the studios wanted they wanted feel good movies that would offer comfort for the losses that everyone had experienced recently. And by the way, Ginger Rogers was initially offered the role that eventually went to Donna Reed. So and she I think later that, that would have been that would have been a very different film. Yeah, indeed. She wondered later if uh, she thought it was too bland after reading the script. Do you agree? Do you think? Yeah, I can. De- I can. S- I can definitely see where she's coming from. It's not like Mary Bailey's given a whole heck of a lot to do in, in the second half of the film. Yeah, I mean, roles for women in the forties. This probably wasn't the most exciting, but definitely was also wasn't the least exciting. Yeah, because I do appreciate that Mary's at least she's like a solid partner for George, and in every version except for the Muppets, um, the partner is just like a solid supporting force that helps them do what they need to do um yeah and and so potter the villain was oscar winner lionel barrymore who was famous at the time as ebenezer scrooge in radio dramas but is also people today might know him better as the great uncle of drew barrymore you know part of the whole barrymore dynasty really Mm Mm-hmm. all actors in that family huh i did not know that and the pharmacist was played by H.B. Warner, who'd actually studied medicine in real life. But the most interesting fact about his involvement was that that scene where he's upset about his son dying in the pharmacy and accidentally is almost poisons a kid. He was actually really drunk when he filmed the scene. And he, the kid who was playing young George, he hit him so hard, the kid's ears bled, like for real. And... Yeah, they, they you know what actually thinking about it, you, you can mm-hmm. tell he's drunk. Yeah, he's drunk. <laughs> he's playing it. He was playing it method. But, <laughs> uh, he, he ended up actually hurting the kid and the kid uh, cried and he hugged him afterwards and said he was sorry. Oh. But then again, the kid also said, I'm going out exploring, going to have a couple of harems, maybe three or four wives. So I don't know, maybe he just deserved a little slap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Frank, Frank Capra, he considered many actors for all the roles. He was just very... This was his first film when he was back from the war and he just really wanted it to be perfect. Um, It was clear. Clearly, it meant a lot to him. So that kind of makes me appreciate it more, even if that drove some wedges in some of his relationships. So the film... I yes, can't I imagine anybody but but Jimmy Stewart playing George Bailey. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, he just inhabits that role. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could see Cary Grant, but I'm glad. I mean, it's the film is what it is because it worked out that way. Yeah. Like the scenes where, you know, George Bailey is in despair. Capra says he didn't think that, that Jimmy Stewart was particularly acting those scenes. That was mm-hmm. that was sort of quite cathartic for Jimmy Stewart. And I, th- I remember seeing an interview where Jimmy Stewart said pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Um, that basically that film let him work out a lot of his issues. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, the film was uh, shot at RKO Pictures Studios over 90 days, and uh, they built that that whole town. It's not a real town. It's a temporary town that was built on the lot over four acres of studio land. And they actually invented the RKO Studios head of special effects, Russell Shearman. He developed a whole new like fake snow compound because this is actually midsummer in California. Mm-hmm. So some of those points where you see Jimmy Stewart like sweating from the forehead and stuff, it's not because of his anxiety. It's because it's freaking hot and he has to wear a coat outside. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, he invented this new compound for snow using water, soap flakes, fomite, and sugar to create like what they called chemical snow. Because before that, 
They were using like painted cornflakes, which would be crunchy when people stepped on it. So they would have to it would cause lots of problems with sound editing. Yeah. But the snow was perfect. <laughs> I mean, it looks, it, yeah. It's so weird that the idea that fake snow had to be invented, but of course it had to be invented. Everything <laughs> has to be invented. It's such yeah, a weird so, idea. Um, actually, I think he ended up winning a technical Oscar for that, I think, if I remember correctly. But yeah, cool. it was a big deal. Um, yeah, that studio later burnt down. So now there's only two surviving film locations. The swimming pool that's unveiled during the high school dance sequence is located in a gymnasium at Beverly Hills High School. and um, the Martini home for the Martini family. That's a uh, home in La Cañada, La Cañada, Flint Ridge, California. Okay. But uh, yeah, the rest of the stu- studio burnt down. Um, the film was nominated for five Oscars, but it got mixed reviews and it was considered not a financial success. It, it was just short of breaking even at the box office. It, it ended its run at $3.3 million, which put it in number 26 for the, the year in terms of gross which is actually the one place ahead of Miracle on 34th Street, but I guess it was more expensive. Yeah. And yeah, we're going to talk about this more because you brought this up in uh, regards to another film, but in uh, 1974, the copyright lapsed and the film fell into the public domain. And that's actually when the story became really popular because for a while they could broadcast it really cheaply. So. Ah, okay. Because yeah, I, I did wonder that with It Happened One mm-hmm. Christmas. Like, because I actually looked up the Wikipedia of it happened one Christmas after I watched it, because I thought that there had to be some kind of legal run, because I didn't see Capra or any of the original screenwriters credited. So, like, right. I, I thought there might have been some legal trouble, but that explains yeah. it. I mean, Capra did call it plagiarism. Right, yeah. We'll talk yeah. about that then. But yeah, Capra says it's his favorite film he ever made, and he showed it to his family every holiday season, and it's also one of Jimmy Stewart's favorites. So, yeah, it's... It has a huge legacy, and it's still usually on the list of the best films ever made. So, are you ready to start actually talking about the plot of this film? Yeah, let's go. (laughs) Because, of course, this plot is the backbone, the source material, the references for all the other films, too. So, released in 1946, the town of Bedford Falls collectively prays for local man George Bailey, who's going through a rough time. And these prayers are heard by some angels who send down one of their own. Clarence Oddbody, a newer angel, second class, a mere 293 years old who hasn't yet earned his wings. But before they send him, they show him George's life to give him some context. George, who as a child saved his brother Harry from drowning and saved the local pharmacist he worked for from accidentally poisoning a kid, who as an adult gave up his dreams of college and seeing the world to take over the local building and loan when his father had an unexpected stroke keeping on in the job when his brother got a better job and a wife and got sent off to war. It's thanks to George that the town hasn't fallen into the clutches of villainous banker Mr. Potter, and the locals are even able to own their own homes. And it hasn't been all bad either. George has many friends, and he married Mary Hatch, a woman he's known his entire life who is truly his equal, jumping into action when their business nearly collapses, volunteering their honeymoon money, and making sacrifices with her husband, not to mention raising four kids. But things go terribly wrong one day when George's kind uncle Billy misplaces 8,000 of the building and loans money, which is equivalent to about 134,000 in today's money. And Mr. Potter, always looking for a way to shut down his competition, makes sure it results in an arrest warrant. Piled on top of these desperate circumstances and petty grievances like a sick child and a collision with a tree, George Bailey finds himself standing on a bridge, staring down into the icy river below, contemplating ending it all. So the bumbling angel Clarence appears to him, granting him his wish of never having been born so that he can see what life would be like without him. In this universe, his brother drowned as a kid and all the platoon of people Harry saved as an adult thus also died. The pharmacist killed that kid and was sent to jail, ruining his life. Potter took over the town, which is now called Pottersville. And Mary is, gasp, an old maid librarian. And Mama Bailey isn't doing too well either. Everybody is generally much worse off and meaner because of it. George begs Clarence to undo his wish and return him to his life. And when he does, George goes cheerfully running home, ready to be arrested and face whatever, because it's better than the alternative. 
but the entire town shows up with all their savings to bail George out of trouble and as a thank you for all he's done for them. And they sing Auld Lang Syne while George and Mary's daughter Zuzu notes that the bell on the Christmas tree has rung. An angel must have gotten his wings. So you sent in your thoughts for each of these movies right after you watched. So these are Luke's first watch thoughts for this movie. So I just finished watching It's a Wonderful Life for the first time. Really not sure what I make of it. Um, I suppose it's one of those things that's built up in your head that it's supposed to be this classic Christmas film. And so whatever you think about it, it was always going to be a bit disappointing. But I can't help but feel that the moral of the story is don't have dreams, kids. (laughs) Don't have ambitions. Just settle down in a small town, marry the first girl you come across, (laughs) and have lots of kids. Yeah, like, I'm not sure the ending is as happy as people say it is. I think it was actually quite a bummer of an ending. Also, I was surprised at how little time, how late it is in the film that you get to the point where he doesn't exist. I'd always thought that would have come about the halfway point of the film, but it actually comes about three quarters, two thirds of the way through the film. I mean, Jimmy Stewart is a great screen presence one of the all-time great screen presences. And Potter is a great villain, just a, an absolutely awesome villain. But yeah, I was a little bit disappointed. I can certainly see why it's one of the Catholic Church's favourite films. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of that echoes what you've already said, but it seems like your opinion has softened since you yeah, said I think, Yeah, I think, yeah, I think watching all the other films that were on the list, all the other films that were inspired by it, Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think puts the original into context, and yeah, like because once once I knew how late the the turn, the reveal, whatever you want right. to call it, is in the film, it didn't. Bo- when I was watching it happen on Christmas, it didn't bother me. So I don't think that's a structural problem with the film. It just wasn't what I was expecting. Your expectations, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I say, I'm not like there is a way of reading it where it's actually not a very positive or uplifting film because. Yeah. yeah, basically, George is a good man, raises a good family, is a pillar of the community, but he never, at any point during the film, ever gets to do anything that he wants to do. Mm. And, you know, he's a guy with ambitions. He's I was a guy like, with just dreams. let the man like, have a honeymoon. Come on. He doesn't even have a honeymoon. <laughs> like, I would have liked, I would have liked it much better at the end if, like, he and Mary had gone off to Paris for just, just a month or something. Just, yeah. Just, to, just to give him something. Like, but you can see, like, coming off of the back of World War II and all the sacrifices that the public has had to make, I can see why they wanted to say, even though your life hasn't been the glamorous whatever that you were hoping for, that doesn't mean that it's you haven't led a good life that affected people and made the world better. Mm. But I just wanted George to win. Just once, because also I think the message can be: don't have dreams, don't have ambitions, just <laughs> settle. And the thing, is, the thing is as well, people do take advantage of George. Mm-hmm. It's not like he is necessarily volunteering to do all these things out of some sense of preternatural goodness. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like his brother feels bad with sticking uh, about sticking him with the job, but you can also see from his brother's perspective, he's like, listen, I got this great opportunity. And even George is like, yeah, yeah, you got this great opportunity. You got to take it. Yeah. But it's like, Harry, I would have appreciated a phone call. I would have appreciated a yeah. letter. I would have appreciated some kind of consultation here. Well, yeah. Um, well, he gets married without even telling his family. Like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Harry. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely think the film's heart is in the right place, but I think mm-hmm. the, the message of it is slightly more ambiguous than, than the, uh, slightly more ambiguous than I was expecting okay. as well. I do. I, I love Clarence. I love the mm-hmm. idea of heaven, the afterlife being this kind of bureaucratic structure <laughs> yeah. and having grades and I I love the idea that people's prayers are responded to literally as though with the emergency services as though we called the fire department yeah. or something. That, <laughs> you gotta watch Supernatural, the TV show. That's a really and good nice, omens. That, yeah, and good omens. That, that's a really nice conceit. Mm-hmm. I like that very much. Yeah. And like yeah. I said, Potter. Like Potter in this version with Lionel Barrymore and the version with Orson Welles is just a, a really great villain very mustache twirly but sometimes you need that (laughs) yeah 
Yeah, I for me, like this film has always been around. I have honestly no idea when I first watched it. Uh, I guess I'm drawn to it because I love alternate reality stories. And this is like the OG, as I said before. But I, it also it deals with themes of depression, which is something that is been in my family and my personal experience for as long as I can remember. And especially around the holidays, I can be for so many different reasons, I can be a really tough time. So I appreciate that there's this film, but I also understand why people say sometimes it's hard for them to watch for that reason, because it's too real. And it's, it, it's amazing to me that this is in the 40s. And there's a lot of Hollywoodisms, as you say, and just sort of there, I know that there are things like they couldn't even use the word lousy in the script. Like there are all these rules about things they couldn't say or talk about. And that's all there. But within the confines of those rules, they were able to tell a really human story. And I guess that's what I appreciate about it. And yeah, it does always make me tear up in the good way. And yeah, by the way, Mary's life in the alternate reality doesn't seem so bad. Like, <laughs> I have to point out, in the original story, she wound up married to an alcoholic that she and her kids are afraid of. So that seems like the short story version seems much worse for her. Yeah, she's a, <laughs> she's a spinster. And she, like I say, she, yeah. she must have been all of 28. Like she, she works at the library. I'm like, you're telling me she reads all day? <laughs> yeah. And, um, uh, so like, speaking of the, the sort of grittier part of it as well, I thought, I thought the bank run... Um, mm-hmm. The bank run was exceptionally well done. Thinking about it, you know, the, the the adult audience at the time would have lived through the Great Depression. They would have been they would have been in bank runs. They would have seen bank runs. So you had to do that scene properly, or it would have destroyed the realism of the. You know, it would have destroyed the. It would have destroyed the audience's belief in the movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, the bank run scene is obviously absolutely iconic. And I actually studied it at Wharton Business School when I was in college. Um, and you can actually, you can hear, it's a very interesting movie from an economic perspective. You can hear a whole breakdown of this movie from that perspective on Planet Money. I'll, I'll link that episode in the show notes because it's a really nice supplement to what we're discussing here. But it's funny though, that the FBI who was led at the time by J. Edgar Hoover, who was in like full red scare mode. Um, He thought that this movie was communist (laughs) propaganda. (laughs) So they, and also the two of the screenwriters, Goodrich and Hackett, that couple, they were quote unquote, very close to known communists. And on one occasion in the recent past, practically lived with known communists and were observed eating lunch every day with known communists. Oh, Jay Ed- <laughs> oh, Jay Edgar. So he had another agent watch the movie and write a report. And the report claimed it was representing a rather obvious attempt to discredit bankers. And the movie deliberately maligned the upper class, attempting to show the people who had money were mean and despicable characters. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, the House on Un- American Activities Committee just let this one slide. <laughs> They're just like whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I wonder whether I wonder whether that was because Jimmy Stewart was like quite active in Republican politics in mm. California. I think, uh, um, yeah. Also, Donna Reed, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, the film though. So it had some of the expected sexism, and it feels a little awkward now. But I have to say, it was many better than some contemporaries on that. But I I do have one question (laughs) that lingers. So if Clarence doesn't want George to jump in the river, you know, and commit suicide, then why does he fake drowning and make George jump into the river? That's (laughs) that's not from the story, by the way. I mean, mean, in fairness, Clarence does kind of admit afterwards that he hadn't really thought the plan through, to be honest. (laughs) So you're telling me that if George did jump in, nothing would have happened anyway. Yeah, I'm gonna say. Enough. Yeah. So yeah, what what would have ha- what would have happened if George drowned saving Clarence? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just some differences from the short story. It's obviously it's it's longer. It's um, it's so it's expanded. You know, the story starts with George on the bridge, and you only learn about his past as he realizes that things have been changed. And in the story, by the way, he's posing as a brush salesman, which maybe already felt dated a few years later. But I guess there are people who are door to door selling. Like at one point, he tries to sell a hairbrush and other ones like a brush for a couch. So just a brush salesman. And um, this this movie, though, it also like it's I think it's a good adaptation because you see how it takes pieces 
from the story and then builds upon them. So for instance, in the story, it is true that one of the things that George checks when he's like try- realizing that it's the wrong reality is he looks at that tree because in the past he had like skimmed the tree and caused a scar there. And in this case, they just have him like full on ramming into the tree. <laughs> and um, in the story, like they don't have the, there's no angels. So there's no, every time a bell rings, an angel gets their wings. But the stranger has George focus on the church bells to return to his reality. And also things like, I like at one point the stranger is gone and George wonders if he's hiding in the bushes. So I like to think that that's the origin of the hide and seek scene in the movie. (laughs) (laughs) She's in the bushes. Mm -hmm. Um, But the original Bedford Falls in the story was based on Califin, New Jersey, because Stern was a Jersey boy. And the movie version, a lot of people say is based on Seneca Falls, New York. And that town has like a themed festival every year and a dedicated museum. But others argue there's no evidence that Capra meant this town specifically. Um, He described it as, quote unquote, every town. And Stern, though, himself said he thought the film was set in Westchester County, New York. So maybe. Yeah, I mean, I I got the very strong vibe. It was somewhere somewhere in sort of the tri-state, you know, New York, Jersey, Pennsylvania. Yeah, definitely. And the historic Iron Bridge in California, the town that was supposed to be based on, is similar to the bridge that George Bailey is considering jumping off of in the movie. So there's that nod. Um, now, yeah, like I said, the, in, there was no angel, no Clarence Oddbody in the story. There was a stranger. Uh, and Clarence in the movie is much more bumbling. And we get a, an added perspective by seeing th- things through his eyes too. Um, I love, I love the line. I love the fact he's got back and forth going with Joseph, um, yeah. his boss in heaven. And, and when they go to, when they go to like the, the speakeasy bar thing, <laughs> I didn't drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. And like also- the, the, the tree just like shakes sometimes to say Joseph's responding. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, it does take George, a long while to work out what's going on, given mm-hmm. that given that nobody recognizes him, given what he said, and given that Clarence is telling yeah. him repeatedly that this is what has happened, it takes a while for the for the message to sink. Yeah, that is not so in the story. In the story, he's like, as soon as he's like the tree scar, he's like, "What? The tree scar's gone?" And then he's like, "Well, I guess what he said about the alternate reality is true." And so then he's going through and he's behaving differently because he doesn't expect people to recognize him. He's just sad that they don't, but he's curious. What are their lives like without me? Yeah, I think that would have been better, to be honest, because, like, yeah, nobody recognizes you. You wish you didn't exist. This Mm -hmm. guy keeps telling you your wish has been granted. Like, George, wake up. Wake up. It's happened. (laughs) Also, it's interesting that in the short story, there is, like, a Mr. Potter mentioned, but he's just mentioned as the owner of a photography studio in passing. And in the movie, they took the name Mr. Potter and they made him like the evil banker character. He's the villain. So and in an earlier draft even had him also being responsible for the near drowning of Harry, George's brother. I think that <laughs> but, would have been too much. Yeah, I see why they pull back. But yeah, in the story, he's the villain. And in sorry, in the movie, he's the villain. And in the story, it's just like depression is the villain, basically. So I I do have a a logistics question. So in the short story, the near drowning of Harry Bailey happens during the summer. And so they're just the two brothers are swimming and uh, Harry Bailey gets a cramp and he starts to go under and his brother saves him in this movie and uh, some of the others. It's about it happens in the winter and Harry falls through the ice, which I guess is more harrowing. But then again, there's a bunch of other kids around. So I'm like. If George wasn't there, why don't the other kids save? Ah, no, no, no. But 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 if you watch it, they all like form a human chain of which. So George, they would have been one person. Yeah, short. they would. They would have. They would have been one person short. They wouldn't have been quite been able to reach Harry. There was the exact right number of people there to do it. All right, all right. I'll accept that. I'll accept that. Yeah. <laughs> it is nice though that Harry's role is expanded in the movie, and the townsfolk are fleshed out a bit more. But yeah, it is interesting. There were some townsfolk in the book and they didn't use any of those character names or professions, but whatever, that's fine. And also added for the movie was Mary's friend, Violet. I'm <laughs> not completely sure what her role is in this Yeah, they, they, they pretty much, they, they eliminate Violet almost entirely from it happened on Christmas. And they eliminate Sam Wainwright as well, which right. is a vast improvement because like, 
the whole fraternity donkey braying thing. Yeah. Like, really annoying. <laughs> But it's, I still think Sam Wainwright is better than the guy that Mary ends up married to in the book. So okay, <laughs> at least he's, he sends in money at the end. Yeah. And also in the short story, Pa Bailey doesn't die. And it's funny. Well, I mean, not funny, but it's it's sad that Pa Bailey, he dies of an aneurysm. And later in life, Capra would also die from com- oh, he dies of a stroke. And later in life, Capra would also die from complications from a s- string of strokes. OK. It's also interesting in the short story. The war is barely mentioned because Stern started writing it in 1938, except to say that George couldn't go for medical reasons. And in the movie, obviously, that plays a much bigger role because of when it came out in 1946. Yeah, I, I thought it was, you can definitely tell it was a very early post-war movie because they have to insert the line, you know, George couldn't go to war because you can only hear out of one ear, so he was 4F, so it's fine, there's no stigma attached, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I have to say, the short story has some, it's slightly more chilling at times. You know, we talk about the movie being depressing, but in the short story, we have this kid, who, who Mary's alternate reality kid is, shooting at um, George with a play gun and asking, why won't you die? You're supposed to be dead. And then at the very end, George goes back and he's with Mary and he had left, like when he was pretending to be a brush salesman, he had left a brush there and he brushes that brush with his hands and he realizes that the other reality was real, you know, wasn't just this movie kind of leaves it open in that fantastic way of maybe he imagined the whole thing. Okay. That would have been a cool touch to put in the movie. I think it's a cool final twist, but yeah, yeah. I also like when you leave things open to interpretation. Um, and also in this story, George doesn't have all this trouble waiting at home. The story's less about the community pulling together to save George and more about George pulling it together for himself to save himself and the people mm. around him. So yeah, fun facts. Capra also had some trouble on the cinematography side with the talent. <laughs> Uh, he found the film's original cinematographer, Vincent Milner, slow and pretentious. So when he got sick, Capra borrowed Joseph Walker from Columbia Studios. But when Rosalind Russell, who's a famous uh, bigwig from back then, she demanded that Walker return to Columbia. So he trained the veteran camera operator, Joseph Byrock, B-Rock, to be his replacement. And so we had three different cinematographers working on this film and each one bringing a different style. So. I don't know if there's a, a video out there somewhere breaking down like who did which shots, but that would be so interesting to see. Okay. Uh, also, so Zuzu is the name of the daughter and it's like, where the hell did that name come from? But there was at the time a popular brand often advertised of Zuzu ginger snaps. So maybe oh. that. Also funny fact. So in the scene where Uncle Billy, he gets drunk uh, at um, Harry and Ruth's wedding party, you know, that they're... Uh, bridal shower uh he so he staggers away uh, off camera and then you hear a crash and uncle billy yells i'm all right i'm all right but it's actually what had happened it wasn't supposed to happen a technician had actually knocked over some equipment <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that was just an uh, mitchell just made an impromptu ad lib to save that shot nice <laughs> well done and Capra ended up leaving it in and rewarded the technician with $10, which is equal to like $150 to today, <laughs> to thank him for his sound improvement. <laughs> <laughs> Capra's first script, by the way, it was going to be more religious. It was going to have Bailey fall to his knees at the end and recite the Lord's Prayer. But he thought that was, yeah, an overly religious tone with the emotional impact of the family and friends was a better way to end. And I agree. Yeah. And by, the way, also- um, mm-hmm. by the way, I'm not sure that the town raising the $8,000 really gets George out of trouble because it's not like that money's not fungible. The original $8,000 yeah. is, still, is still missing. And presumably Potter has still got the $8,000 right. as well. Yeah, In my head canon, like the, the cops go and arrest Potter. They work, they work it out. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did you notice, by the way, that Uncle Billy, his pets in the film? No. So at one point, there's like a pet squirrel showing up on his shoulder. But the one that everyone talks about is there's a raven that shows up three times. Okay. So this raven is actually uh, the name. His name is Jimmy in real life. 
And Frank Capra liked this raven and he put him in every film he made after 1938. Okay. Um, And the raven, though, interestingly, shows up three times. And it's when the three worst things, it's related to like the three worst incidents in the film. So when George's father dies during the bank run and after Uncle Billy loses the money, that's when we see the raven. Okay. Interesting note. Also, just interesting random note is Mark Twain is referenced here. And every other movie that we talk about either also references Mark Twain or uses a Dickens reference instead. Yeah. So I just wanted to wrap up the discussion of the main film here with something that that Bob said, did I Jedi Bob, that I think is, you know, about about the perceived negativity in the film and how we can interpret it today. So he said, I know the holidays can be difficult for many of us. Some tend to focus on regrets or find themselves wondering if what they do or who they are ultimately matters at year's end. I think um, It's a Wonderful Life tries to encourage viewers that while we may never know all the answers, we should do our best to remember that whether we believe it or not, we're capable of making a positive impact on others without realizing it. I believe people need to hear that they're appreciated. They matter. And the world is a better place with them in it. That need is greater than ever these days, since we live in the age of the anonymous angry commenters who make it their business to degrade others online. Such anonymous commenters honestly make me think of George when we see him at his worst and lashing out at others, coming from a place of hurt, no doubt. Watching the film in 2023 and observing Mr. Potter tends to make me think of those who cash in on the misdirected fear and frustration in people, those who stoke it. Those who have wished celebrities, fans, etc., terminally ill or worse, and encourage others to do the same. Potter seems like the precursor to our modern day internet troll when he opines, you're worth more dead than alive. The thing is, that's just someone's warped, frustrated opinion. As much as they like to believe that it's a fact or decree, it isn't. The opening scene in the film continues to resonate with me. There are more in Bedford Falls rooting for George than he realizes. He's just chosen to let a malicious, mouthy minority of one drown out those who love him. The same can be said for us in 2023. So since I have the opportunity, this one goes out to those who have been through the ringer this year. Maybe you've lost someone, you're struggling financially, you've been bothered and bewildered online, or you live far away from family and friends. Maybe we've chatted online and maybe we've never met. But one thing is certain, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Bob. That was beautiful. Thank you, Bob. That was very sweet. So moving on from that lovely sentiment to a movie we've teased enough already. Um, we've got the only movie I think that we watched that can actually be called a remake. And in this case, one of the most scene by scene remakes I've ever seen. And uh, that would be It Happened One Christmas, the 1977 film. So this was released three years after that lapse into the public domain that made the story so widely popular today. And um, this film is a gender swapped It's a Wonderful Life in an almost, yeah, almost scene by scene remake. As I said, the story centers on Mary Bailey, who saves her brother Harry from drowning, stops the local pharmacist from poisoning a child and everything possible for her to have done within the gendered constraints of her time. uh, That's the same as the original movie. But in this version, she's marrying a successful builder named George Hatch, who becomes her partner in life. And the sacrifices that they make together until it all goes horribly wrong in exactly the same way as the original film. But ultimately the story has a happy ending again, the same happy ending as the original film. So Luke, this is what you had to say after watching the film. Okay. So I just finished watching it happen one Christmas. Um, I actually quite like that. I think I liked it a little bit better on first watching than the original. It's a wonderful life, even though the two are practically identical. I think it was just more that I knew what to expect and sort of knew what the story was this time. I have to say, before I recorded this, I had to look up, I went to look up on Wikipedia what the reaction to uh, It Happened One Christmas was, because I'm surprised there wasn't any uh, legal issues because it's in places, as far as I can tell, an almost shot for shot remake. The script seemed if not identical, then very nearly identical. Um, so I, I was surprised there wasn't any legal trouble, although Frank Capra, the director of the original, 
It's a Wonderful Life did apparently refer to it happened one Christmas as being um, plagiarism, and I can see what he means. Apart from that, yeah, it was fine. It was <laughs> very sort of late 1970s, but overall I enjoyed it. Also, Orson Welles, great villain. Yeah, that's all I've got to say, really. <laughs> Yeah, so we we briefly touched on the copyright stuff, but basically the U.S. Copyright of the U.S. Copyright Act of 1909 protected films published before 1964 for an initial term of 28 years from when they were released. So at the end of that first term, the copyright holder was allowed to apply for a second term of 28 years, but in 1974, when that term was up. Um, Republic Pictures, the original copyright owners, didn't apply for the second term, which was probably a clerical error, but the film fell into the public domain. And because of that, as I said, it was cheap to broadcast, so it was broadcast a lot. And this 1977 remake was made three years after that, you know, lapsing into uh, public domain. So this had an effect on a few things. It also... It also is why it took a while for it to be colorized because Capra at first, he lobbied for it. He wanted to be colorized. He even was going to pay for half of it. But since the film was considered public domain, the people who were doing the colorizing would rather not have his inputs. They just send his money back because they're like, we don't want to deal with you and we don't want you to have artistic control. So then he and Jimmy Stewart both ended up campaigning against the colorization. Um Although now you'll see often the 2007 colorized version. I've never got the urge to colorize black and white films. It's like retroscoping a 2D film into 3D. It's it's just not made. The original film wasn't made with that technology in mind. It wasn't made with that color mm-hmm. in mind. Um, I always remember the Elvis Costello quote about colorized films. It's like you'd let a small child draw with crayons on the screen. <laughs> I just don't get it. Um, I mean... I think it can be, there can be interesting artistic reasons to do it. Like, for instance, the recent film Werewolf by Night, it was originally released in black and white, you know, to, as a nod to classic horror films. But even when they were doing that, the the director was thinking about how it would be colorized and they used like a classic colorization method anyway. And I've heard as far as this film, it, there are younger generations who see it colorized where like their eyes glaze over at black and white. They watched it when it's colorized and then okay. they enjoy it. So okay, uh, I don't hate that it exists, but yeah, you and I both, we watched the black and white version. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I have to say, like, I watched the original It's a Wonderful Life, obviously. It was dead easy to get from Amazon. It's on Amazon Prime. The, okay. Uh, it happened it's on Sky from- Showtime here. Yeah. It happened one Christmas. Um, I had to watch it in the file you sent me because it was impossible. It's on YouTube. Oh, okay. Well, you can find the entire movie on okay. YouTube now. Yeah, but yeah, because um, like it, it's it sort of fell out of wide distribution, and you can kind of mm-hmm. see, you can kind of see why because it is so faithful to the original, apart from the the gender swapping bit of it, and they don't even make a big deal of the the gender swap element that it's just I mean I watched that last night and recorded that last night and having slept on it like I said at the beginning of the podcast it's not a bad film but it it just is kind of a pointless one I yeah. I don't I don't understand why you would make a film that stuck that rigidly to the original source I mean- material yeah, okay, but you and I both said that we it made us enjoy it. I think a film so also like remakes like The Parent Trap and I don't know, lots of other films that have been remade in very similar ways. Um and I don't I don't know. I don't I don't see a problem with it. I see for this one, I would suggest to anyone who enjoys It's a Wonderful Life and wants to try a different variation, definitely 100% go watch it happen one Christmas, you know, you're, you're probably going to, it's at least an interesting curiosity, especially with that cast. It is very well acted. Uh, Mm -hmm. Nolo Thomas as Mary Bailey does a really good job um, because she brings the same energy as Jimmy Stewart, but Mm. also the fact that it's been gender swapped does mean that she brings, she brings something else to it. There is a maternal Mm-hmm. It's kind of a maternal energy. To There's some perform. different nuances, yeah. Yeah. By the way, random fun fact um, about It's a Wonderful Life. 
that's snuck into this part of my notes. I just, but I think it's interesting to note that um, it was "It's a Wonderful Life" was released as one of the first films on CD-ROM before DVDs because of this copyright issue, and that happened in 1993. But that was also the year that things changed because uh, while the film had fallen out of copyright, um, the estate of the writer uh, Stern had gotten the um, greatest gift the story was based on. So he first self-published that story. So it wasn't copyrighted. And then later had an officially published version that was copyrighted. And so through some technical loop-de-loops, they managed to say, well, if this version of this story is copyrighted and we're based off of that version, thereby this film is also copyrighted. So <laughs> that's why films like um, It Happened One Christmas and Clarence were able to slip through. But now you'll see them being much more careful about oh, the okay. attributions. And yeah, now it's known for, it's owned by Paramount. And uh, that's why you'll find it on Sky Showtime here and often on Paramount owned things. And NBC is the only U.S. broadcaster licensed to show it. Okay, so is that um, like a, is that like a staple of Christmas Eve TV then on NBC? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and as far as this film, it happened one Christmas. Yeah, you're right. The Capra called it plagiarism, but I don't agree that plagiarism is the right word because it is a very, very much a copy, but it never hid what it was. So it's not like it's not lying and pretending that it's not based on his film. Yeah, that, um, that's it's that's a remake. True. Yeah. That's true, but it obviously it would have never happened without that copyright loophole. <laughs> no. And it's also they're also not lying about it too, or shy about it too, because the title is a play on the Frank Capra film. It happened one night. Yeah, there's doubling down on that. <laughs> it was initially made as an ABC Sunday night movie, which with the cast, I'm surprised, but it was directed by Donald Rye, screenplay by Lionel Chetwind. Starring Marlon Thomas, Wayne Rogers, Orson Welles, and Cloris Leachman. Now, three three of those are huge names to me. The other one, I wasn't familiar with him, but he reminded me so much of Will Ferrell in looks. Did you have that too? Yeah, yeah I, I was <laughs> gonna bring that. I was if you hadn't have brought that up, I was gonna bring that up. He does not not so much Will Ferrell, but a Will Ferrell character, like a, a Will right. Ferrell um, Saturday Night Live character. Yeah, he does look. <laughs> Yeah, he does look like Will Ferrell. And also yeah, like, I found that distracting at time, but that's not the film's fault. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, also when you see Orson Welles come up, you know, instant, oh, that's who they've got to play Potter. Yeah, because yeah. there, there's no other part in that film he could play. Right, right, exactly. As soon as you see his name, you're like, yeah, who's he going to be, Harry? No. <laughs> you know, but, I mean, you say it's a surprise they got him, but, like, that was the part, that was sort of, Late period Orson Welles, right. where he was doing anything for a paycheck. Um, right. Basically. Well, yeah. And Cloris Leachman, as, you know, gender slopped Clarence becomes Clara, she received her 10th Emmy nomination for this role. Did you, What did you think of Clara versus the Clarence of the previous film? Uh, I, mean, I think Cloris Leachman does a, does a good... Does a good job, but but no, I, I, I go with Clarence from, from the original. <laughs> um, I actually... I like Clara. I think she had, for me, I found her funnier, but I also have questions about what accent she was going for. I think she was like trying to do Irish. I I, I think it was. Clara Leachman's from the Midwest. Yeah, no, I, I, think it, I, I think it was the Dick Van Dyke school of cockening, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. But she does, she brings a different energy and she, especially when she promises to guide, not save, but really she means both. <laughs> she made me laugh. Um, I did have to laugh though. They gender swapped everyone, but their boss in heaven, Joseph, still's got to be a dude. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We, 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 we can gender swap everybody, but we're not we're not gender swapping Joseph. Not the boss. That's too far. Yeah. <laughs> as far as as far as uh, Wells, though, I, I think he yeah he played that part really well because you see, there's also the fact that you know the main character is a female in this version. There's that extra layer where. Potter begrudgingly respects her, but it almost means more in a way because he's sexist, but then also he has to admit that this woman knows what she's doing. Yeah, and like, I think this is one of the rare rare occasions in late period Orson Welles where he actually looked like he was trying. Um, yeah, you know, okay, he yeah, was, yeah. He looked like he was relatively sober on it's set true. actually putting some, putting some effort in. Yeah, that's true. 
Although, yeah, it's it's extra icky in this version when he's encouraging Mary to commit suicide for her life insurance. <laughs> he's like, oh, sounds like you are worth more dead than alive. Like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to call out one weird thing that was happening on the video end where they, do you notice there's like that weird freeze framing that they would do sometimes? I presume, I presume that's where the commercial breaks would have gone. No, but not just that. Well, it, it like they they would keep talking, but the screen would freeze. Oh, like I, th- I thought that was just my laptop. But I thought that yeah, was my I thought at first too, but I was like, no, oh, that's actually that, that, that's that's a actually weird seventies sh- filmmaking that's thing. The way they shot it, yeah, yeah. That, is, that is weird. And I also we were talking about like the technological advances in the snow for the original movie. This one, it felt like the snow was just a filter they put on top, like yeah, they weren't think, actually yeah, being yeah, hit by snow yeah. of any sort. <laughs> Um, just to talk through some of the changes. So they do, they credit Stern, which is probably because of that copyright thing. Uh, but really I have to say this film, it's really only based on the prior film. So anything that was changed in the prior film was changed in this film as well. And then they made a few additional changes. So I, I do feel like they paid a bit more attention to the historicity of the costuming and the vehicles and things like that. Um, I guess it's like the benefit of having more hindsight. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the thing. For It's a Wonderful Life, the costumes and stuff were just how people dressed. Right. Um, <laughs> but when they went back in the past to like the 20s, they didn't really yeah. change it that much. And also in this version, like everyone in town goes to war, not just Harry. And there's a, just a, there's a lot more about people writing home for war, just a lot more acknowledgement of the war. And we also see George as the oil man during the Great Depression, which was a big part of American history at that time, but definitely wasn't brought up in the yeah. story or the previous movie. I do kind of like the d- dynamic between George and Mary better. So I, I like this line when they're kids, like, does he like her? Yes. That's why he spends a lot of time not looking at her. <laughs> <laughs> like him? Yes. That's why she spends a lot of time not looking at him. <laughs> And then uh, she calls him out later for not writing to her. And but George does actually try harder for his for her affection once he's back, unlike uh, in the original movie. But I miss the last of the moon moment. Yeah, I guess it's too cheesy, but yeah, <laughs> it's iconic. It is. It is. But they do talk more about real life together, like, and they're not really using Sam to make each other jealous in that immature way. So it, it feels more like they chose each other, not just that they were. Yeah, happens into that. Yeah, I think that's actually now you're saying all the stuff. It's it's not quite as it's not quite as beat for beat as mm-hmm. as maybe as maybe I thought it was. I'm, I'm I may well have to go back and rewatch that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I've sort of come come to one conclusion, then I've come to another conclusion, and now you're moving me on to a third <laughs> conclusion here, Alicia. Well, that's why I say anyone who's a fan of the original film, give this one a try. Um, I also think that Mary being a woman adds an extra reason for her to be held back. Like, for instance, that's why she's her brother gets sent to college instead of her. Yeah, that's like, true. And uh, she also has to, she has to be better behaved, though. So there's no partying with her brother in their parents' house. Like. <laughs> but yeah, Vi's role, she's still in the film. But what role is she really here to play other than making me laugh when she switches to Sam's arm as soon as he <laughs> talks about money? <laughs> Uh, the pool reveal in this version is a drunken dare rather than an act of jealousy, but it's the same location as the original film. So kudos for that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And I also think it's funny and bringing this up because it comes back in another movie later. There's a, I love when they have the whole exchange by the bushes, there's no, none of that, like Mary or George hiding in the bushes, begging for their robe, because if it doesn't make sense for a woman to do it to a man, it doesn't make sense for a man to do it to a woman. That's just seen as <laughs> the original, and I like it. But uh, they talk about that house, of course, that broken down house, and she tells him this story about Mr. Potter and the ambassador's wife, and then he eventually calls her out. He's like, wait, are you lying? She <laughs> says, I don't lie. I create. <laughs> I guess, yeah, there's maybe some later versions uh, becoming journalists make sense off the back of that. Yeah. <laughs> it's random thing that I noticed. There's an inconsistent number of kids. So there's three kids in this movie, four kids in the first movie, two in the story. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> Just stuck out to me. Um, and instead of Zuzu, they call the kids Susie in the story, which, yeah. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> I don't think Zuzu aged well as a name. Um, but yeah, she doesn't even know her dad because he's been away at war. 
Oh, yeah. I was worried that he might actually not come back home when she was at that train station <laughs> waiting. <laughs> yeah, it would have been. I mean, that, that would have been quite a radical departure. But yeah, now that you say it, that, that would have been. Yeah, I can, I can see where you were coming from. <laughs> and I'm glad that Mary doesn't jump in to save Clara in this version. She actually goes and runs down the <laughs> hill because that's the more sensible thing to do. <laughs> But on the ding for this version is George the Creepy Mechanic. I'm like, no, after that, I could not go yeah, back and no, be happily married no, to no, this that's, man. That's wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's wrong. Although, yeah, I do find it interesting that this movie, and I guess the original too, um, emphasizes that you've been given a great gift, which is to see what the world would have been without you. But in um, the original story, the great gift is the gift of life. Just yeah, being born. So this was not the only attempt to remake this movie. Um, This is definitely by far the most remakey remake. (laughs) But there were also, it was adapted a few times for radio, uh, even with Stuart and Reed reprising their role three times. And there have been stage versions, including stage versions of the radio play. So people sit on stage and read the radio play. (laughs) That's weird. Um, most notably, in 1997, PBS aired Merry Christmas, George Bailey, which was a taped live performance. And the yeah, it was it was a charity benefit. And the, the cast was all stars. Like So we had Bill Pullman as George, Nathan Lane as Clarence, Martin Landau as Mr. Potter, Penelope Ann Miller as Mary, and Sally Field as Ma Bailey. That is a great cast. Yeah, like I, if, I, if there were a '90s movie version, that would be your more or less ideal cast. <laughs> I wish I could find a, a videotape of it, but I wasn't able to do so. Yeah. Um, but I was able to find some songs from the local musicals, like that were made from this. You can find those some of those songs on YouTube. Okay, <laughs> and I have to say, it's not bad. But attempts at professional musicals were thwarted by the estate of Stern, the writer of the <laughs> story. <laughs> Although Paul McCartney was reportedly working on a musical before the pandemic. So we haven't heard anything about it in the years since. But okay. That would be interesting. Yeah. So on Reddit, uh, user Nasty Knickers pointed out to me, uh, they said, I really enjoyed the Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live skits where they do their own versions. So it was, it's definitely in the cultural zeitgeist and ripe for satire. It's Wonderful Life. All the satire seems to focus on the ending. So we've got It's a Wonderful Life, The Lost Ending, which is like the 1986 SNL short that was introduced by William Shatner. And it shows, and so this is again quoting Nasty Knickers. This first clip shows how Mr. Potter got his just desserts. In the movie, George gets saved by his friends and realizes friends, not money, make a man truly rich. However, as new audiences see the movie, they just want justice for George and to see Mr. Potter punished for his treachery. So <laughs> this satire does it. Have you seen that one? Uh, no, I haven't. I can send you all the links too. I can post them in the show notes for anyone who's curious as well. And there's also This You Call a Wonderful Life, which is an SNL skit about what if it was a Hanukkah movie and it's introduced <laughs> to the hater. So that one's 10 years old. Um, there's also a Trump version from four years ago <laughs> where there's prayers for Trump played by Alec Baldwin, of course. And uh, yeah, Clarence is Keenan Thompson. <laughs> and <laughs> they show Trump a world where he's not president and he's better off and everyone else is better off. And there's like an insane list of stars who show up, uh, like up to and including De Niro. But then Trump decides to go back every anyway. And the moral at the end is every time a bell rings, someone quits or goes to jail. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Comedy Central did their own like more realistic take four years ago where the town pulls together all their money and it's still not enough. But no one <laughs> seems to understand that. <laughs> I also have to call out here that there was actually Peter Capaldi wrote and directed a, an Oscar winning short in the 90s, in the mid-90s, called Franz Kafka's It's a Wonderful Life. (laughs) And (laughs) this is a much looser parody starring Richard E. Grant. So he plays Kafka, who's trying to write the book, The Metamorphosis, but he can't decide what Gregor Samsa will get transformed into. And he keeps getting interrupted by these increasingly ridiculous situations. And eventually... He's inspired. He realizes it's going to be a cockroach, but then he kills a cockroach that inspires him. And he's devastated that he's by this betrayal that he's done until all of his neighbors who interrupted him throughout the film 
bring him bugs from their houses to make up for the loss. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, yeah, it's not just a, a, the satire, but there's also been attempts to make sequels. Uh, so we have, there was a couple books in 2011. There was The Last Temptation of Clarence Oddbody by <laughs> John Jughead Pearson. <laughs> so the official marketing blurb says, what if George Bailey wasn't saved by his guardian angel, Clarence Oddbody, on that snowy Christmas Eve in Bedford Falls? This reimagining of the beloved Frank Capra classic, It's a Wonderful Life, and the Philip Van Doren Stern story that inspired it, tells the story of Bedford Falls and its inhabitants after the death of their drama's central character. The Last Temptation of Clarence Oddbody restores the dark undercurrent mm -hmm. of Van Doren Stern's short story, The Greatest Gift, to the uplifting plot of Capra's film, and explores how the familiar characters in it might respond to the dire circumstances created by George Bailey's disappearance from their lives. The paths of an introspective cab driver, a ruthless henchman, and a wayward daughter collide nearly 20 years later in the town that defines their reputations for better or for worse. And the reviews call this an emotionally disturbing roller coaster that makes you think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I did not read it. There is another book. Uh, that was released two years later in 2013 called Return to Bedford Falls, a modern sequel to It's a Wonderful Life by William Sellers. This blurb says, remember Christmas Eve 1945? The warrant for the arrest of George Bailey is torn up. Violet Bick decides to stay in town and Bedford Falls is saved from the clutches of the evil Harry Potter. Henry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> or is it? Let's revisit Bedford Falls to find out how things are going today. Return to Bedford Falls recounts the key events in the movie and then takes us forward in time, bringing readers up to date, describing the events that occurred after that fateful day in December 1945. Constantine Cavaldi, our storyteller, has a hankering to discover what happened to the Bailey family, the citizens, and the town. Join Mr. Cavaldi as he describes what he learned through several years of research. Your reading efforts will be rewarded with twists and turns, surprises, and joy. But I have to say the reviews are not good for that book. <laughs> okay. So yeah, there's been some film attempts too. There's only one film, quote unquote, sequel that's ever been made in 1990, and we're about to talk about it. But to be very clear, this sequel should not be considered canon. <laughs> it's a product of the copyright opening <laughs> and will not enhance your understanding and appreciation of the original <laughs> film. <laughs> oh boy, will it, will it not enhance your appreciation of the original? <laughs> <laughs> but this was not the last attempt to make a sequel. The most notable attempt was actually in, uh, announced in 2013. It was going to be called It's a Wonderful Life, The Rest of the Story. And uh, it was going to star Carolyn Grimes, who is the actress who played Zuzu, the child in the original. But now she would be you know, back as an older woman and she would be an angel herself. Back to guide George Bailey's grandson, who apparently is just like a little shit, only now... She's going to show him how life would have been better if he weren't born to scare him into being a better person. <laughs> what oh. do you think of that premise? Oh, yeah. No, make it. If there's a Kickstarter going for that, I'm definitely going to <laughs> that. I like that idea. Well, the actress, uh, Carolyn Grimes, agrees. She says, the new film will retain the feeling of the original and it simply must be shared. I've probably read close to 20 scripts over the years suggesting a sequel to It's a Wonderful Life, but none of them were any good. The script by Bob Farnsworth and Martha Bolton was wonderful, and I wanted to be involved with this version of the film immediately. Now, if it had been made, the 60-year gap would have been one of the longest sequel gaps in history, but Paramount quickly stepped in and shut that down. <laughs> <laughs> nix that, nix that. <laughs> <And they're> like, <laughs> nope, <laughs> nope. nope. <laughs> so, yeah, to put it in It's a Wonderful Life terms, though, the film that did get made, that we're about to talk about, it's... Think of it as a warning from Clarence Oddbody that maybe this <laughs> world is better off if the sequel were never born. <laughs> okay. I, I've been really struggling to think how to talk about this. Because... Well, I, I, first we're going to start with what you okay. said when you first watched it. So I've just finished watching Clarence, the 1990 sequel to uh, It's a Wonderful Life. I suppose it's a sequel focusing on Clarence Oddbody, the angel. I'm really not quite sure what to say about this. It was the most 90s thing I've ever seen. It was really bad. I mean, really, that's 90 minutes of my life. I'm never <laughs> going to get back. And not 
it was bad in the way that, like, the Hallmark movie was, where it's so bad and <laughs> kind of funny. This was just bad. It was just naff. It was just awful. Um, yeah, the things I do for this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Really wonder what Alicia. Hopefully, Alicia's going to be a bit more eloquent in talking about this than I am. <laughs> but I'm just in a state of shock at the moment that, <laughs> that that film could ever get made. That somebody <laughs> read that script and go, went, "Yeah, let's make that. Let's put people in front of the camera." <laughs> Good grief! It was bad. <laughs> So just to summarize for people what we're talking about it before we what we're talking about before we get into it as a summary in this stiltily acted low res and let me make this clear wholly unauthorized uh, unofficial made for TV sequel the angel named Clarence Oddbody has been a shut in since a bad angeling experience sometime after George Bailey we don't know what happened but apparently it caused him to lose his entire personality and now he's being sent back to Earth to help the family of his new angel friend, Jeremy. He ends up moving in with them, of course, pretending to be human. But their youngest daughter is on to him. And he tells the family's teenage son to man up, causing that kid to decide to skip school and get a job. So Clarence pretends to be a teenage boy, but then he's too awesome at school and makes things even tougher when the kid returns. Totally, by the way, moving in on Jeremy's wife, Rachel, this whole time. She eventually kisses him. And though Jeremy's been watching all this from heaven, they elected not to give us his reaction shot at that particular moment. But when she finds out he's been meddling with her kids, things get dark and it gets real weird that he's still there in the house. But then Clarence fixes everything by getting the mom's computer game to speak English and Rachel gets to visit her husband in heaven briefly before returning to Earth to mom and stuff in a very anticlimactic ending. And Clarence's angel boss, Joseph, rides away in a taxi cab that flies off into the sky like Santa's sleigh. <laughs> do you have anything to add to that uh, summary? No, except that, except that they do a really weird thing where like the angels age in reverse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They do like a whole Benjamin Button thing and it's, really weird it's really yeah. odd so joseph's a child which is and joseph's way more involved in this version it's not just like the tree shaking but joseph's like there a lot but it also appears like in a weird sexy pose on the bed at one point like <laughs> yeah. propped up it's on his just, side like, yeah. like 12 i'm like no no you know it's just it's just <laughs> it's just so bad like because I, um, I, I literally, because you know, we always try and do the, we always try and look for the positives on right. the podcast. It's like a founding principle of the podcast, and I, I, I couldn't find any <laughs> in this film. I really couldn't. Like you say, listen, I had a blast watching this film because it is such a train wreck. <laughs> no, but that, that's the thing. Like the Hallmark movie is a train wreck. The Hallmark movie yeah, is Yeah, but that's a different way. This, that's this, like, that's just a Hallmark train. Yeah, that's just a Hallmark movie. This, it's a decent this, one for that. This must be what, like having your brain eaten by a parasite. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the, the best I could come up with is, I think if you're going to do, if you're going to do a podcast that's a review of content, it helps every now and then to watch genuinely terrible content. Just, just, <laughs> so you appreciate the good stuff. Yeah, just, just a level set. Like when, when, you, <laughs> when you see people going off on Twitter about how the Marvels is the worst movie ever or no. Iron Man 2 is, watch the worst, Clarence. <laughs> is the worst movie ever. No, I've seen bad movies. I've seen terrible movies. Go on with yeah. Clarence. <laughs> So this movie was originally made for the Family Channel, and now I could only, I like scoured all over for all these movies, and this one I could only find on Freebie. So uh. yeah, I, I actually because like you did send them all over as files, but I actually did watch it on I actually did watch it on Freebie, and it took yeah. ages to watch because there are adverts like every yeah. every five minutes. So it made it made a ninety minute movie over two hours long. And so, do you want to guess what the Rotten Tomato score is? It's rated G, by the way, which I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Is it possible for Rotten Tomatoes to go into minus, into minus <laughs> numbers? 
it's not negative, but it's 17%, which is yeah, that's a pretty line. dire. Yeah. I, I'd say it has by far the worst video quality of all the films, which is funny because it's like the third oldest. And granted, yes, I know that It's a Wonderful Life has been remastered and stuff, but yeah. still. But yeah, that, that's yeah. kind of what that's kind of what I meant by it's the most nineties thing I've ever seen. Because it has that weird sheen that you only get like when you've got a transfer from film to V A to VHS. Yeah. And also like it's got the sort of early nineties moral panic about video right. video games running through it. Right. So yeah. Well, because it's nineteen ninety, so when it was you know, written and filmed, it was probably even like late eighties. Yeah. So that, it's yeah. That is a film where is it if you'd ask if you if I didn't know what the date was and you asked me what date that was made, it would have been sometime between nineteen ninety 1990 and nineteen ninety two. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a very specific there's a very specific like twenty four month window. Yeah. Um, where that film could have been made. So in this case, um in this case, Clarence, a titular character, is played by Robert Carradine, who people might know as the main guy in Revenge of the Nerds. So yeah. that was an interesting casting. Like, Robert um, Car- this is the thing, Robert Carradine can act. But yeah. He, when, like, when all of the acting is bad, it's the director's fault. Yeah, Sorry. It's just like, is that Robert Carradine or is that a large chest of drawers? Why is that <laughs> walking down the street? It is so wooden and stilted. Although at least Clarence is still bumbling, so that's consistent with yeah. the first film, at least. I suppose, um, I suppose it is. Well, that, that, oh my gosh, he says some of the most awkward things, like when he says to the little girl, have you ever been to heaven? And <laughs> uh, she asks, sorry, so the little girl, Jill, asks him, have you ever been to heaven? And he says, yes, plenty of times. When? Every time I see a smile like yours, that's heaven to me. You know, you and know, the ten the ten year old gives like the that's the lamest shit I've ever heard face that was like all of us in that moment. You know, you know, you know what that bit reminded me of? It's it's that scene mm. in air, it's that scene in airplane. Uh, Jimmy, have you ever seen a grown man naked? Have you have you ever seen the inside of a Turkish prison? Do you like films <laughs> about gladiators? Yeah, it's just like I said in the the, the, the initial voice note. I I cannot for the life of me, understand how somebody... There must have been a production meeting. Somebody must have greenlit this monstrosity. (laughs) (laughs) And I I just... I was really glad, actually, you did the summary, Alicia, because I watched this on... We're recording on Thursday. I watched this on Tuesday. I have no memory of the last 25 minutes or so. (laughs) Well, so this was also the film that I said... It was, I said, I know it's bad. You don't have to watch it if I don't want to. But you're like, nah, I want to watch this. You just, you were like, I have to see this train wreck happen. Yeah. But like I said, I thought it was, <laughs> gonna, I thought it was going to be so bad. It's, it's funny territory, but I don't. It was for me. You thought it was. I just thought it was awful and turgid. Yeah. My, my letterbox review was one and a half stars. It's so ugly. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the, the movie, It's a Wonderful Life versus a Story, Clarence is definitely more involved, but he's way more involved here. Like in, in It's a Wonderful Life, Clarence dragged George back from the brink. In this version, Clarence drove Rachel to the brink first and then <laughs> let her not fall over. <laughs> I genuinely thought, I, I know what they're going to do here. I know what they're going to do here. Clarence is going to give up being an angel. He's going to become mortal again, and they're going to get mad. They're going to they're going to play this for romance. Oh yeah, uh, no, I was I was so icked out by that. I'm like, Jeremy's watching. Like you're supposed to be his friend. Like what is your end game here? <laughs> yeah, but like you said, Jeremy seems perfectly cool with this. Yeah, and then yeah, I also I have to call out. I noticed that the actor who plays the banker's uh, henchman. There's always a banker's henchman, but we don't talk about them much because they don't often play an important role. But it was played here by Julian Reishings, who is an actor with a very distinctive face who people notice from like DC movies and things like that. Um, definitely, you know, not doing much here. Uh, but they do at least give a Mark Twain reference to tie to the original, <laughs> but calls him Samuel Clemens, which is his real name. So, okay, point there. Mm. And also just point for ridiculousness when the banker with a mullet eats an entire lobster while twirling his mustache during a client <laughs> meeting. <laughs> He's just chowing down on a lobster. He's like, you want some? It's the biggest lobster I've ever seen. That was like some sort of mutant crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think he was like 
two lobsters joined together. <laughs> uh, I have to compliment, though, there were two good performances, even though there was a clear lack of direction. There were two good performances in this, and that was the the mother, Rachel, played by Kate Trotter, and the little girl, Jill, who's played by Rachel Blanchard, who actually grew up to, she's now like quite famous in her own right. She's from You, Me, Her, and The Summer I Turned Pretty. But those seem like the only two characters who tried in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> the only two actors who tried. The cinematography also had some moments. Uh, so yeah, it was low res, so sometimes it's tough, tough to see. But there, there was some interesting camera work. So I have to give a shout out to Glenn McPherson for that. And also, I have to compliment them. The kids are more present than the, in the originals. And it continues the football theme. So in the uh, two originals, we have at some point George or Mary, yeah, George being forced to dress up in football player clothes. Here we have Clarence, I don't know, doing a weird disappear football game <laughs> that only gets his charge into more trouble. Yeah. And I just have to finish with one last thing. End on a high note. Unless you have, do you have any more gripes before I end no, on a high no, note? No, no, no. I, I, I don't really want to think anymore about that. <laughs> okay. Okay, I have to end on a high note with uh, a moment I really appreciated in the realms of it being early 90s is we've got a father-son code off, father-son code <laughs> off. <laughs> they do tip a tip a son code off. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and they're like, Dad, remember when we used to code off? <laughs> oh, see, it was, it was, I had fun. I had fun with it. <laughs> Like I say, it's the closest I ever want to come to having my brain eaten by a parasite. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, that ends the uh, chapter of talking about the original content around It's Wonderful Life. And uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we get back, we're going to talk about three tributes to It's Wonderful Life that are fun and wildly divergent in their own ways. All right, we're going to we're going to continue moving forward chronologically, and so that means that we're going to talk about my least favorite movie, and you get to hate on me for not liking the Muppets. Uh, we're going to talk about it's a very Muppets Christmas movie. To th- it was released in two thousand two, and we're going yeah, to well, begin. I mean, like, so again, it's so if you'd asked me when that was made, it would be made yeah. in two thousand two <laughs> and two thousand. Oh yeah, I think much more so, especially with this. We'll talk about that, but. This is what you said when you first watched it. Well, I've just finished watching A Very Muppet Christmas. I uh, really enjoyed it. How can you not enjoy the Muppets? <laughs> Gonzo, Statler and Waldorf <laughs> are three of my favourite fictional characters of all time. Um, I got really, really strong early 2000s nostalgia. There are a lot of celebrity cameos in this. It's obviously not the best Muppets Christmas movie. That will always be a Muppets Christmas Carol, but it's the Muppets. How can you not like the Muppets? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> it's me. I'm the I'm the person who doesn't like the Muppets. It's me. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um. Well, do you want to go? Do you want to go first then? Well, okay. Let me just uh, summarize the plot real quick, and then we can dive into it. Okay. Uh, so. In this nonsensical take on this tale constructed as a vehicle to shove as many early naughty stars and references in your face as possible, mean Joan Cusack, as Rachel Bitterman, inherits a bank when her husband dies. She wants to shut down the Muppets Theater and turn it into a more profitable nightclub. Pepe, the shrimpy one, turns coat and decides to be her manservant, but when she turns out to be abusively uninto him creeping on her, he turns on her again and manages to get an application to turn the theater into a landmark processed and approved within a single evening. That's the true Christmas miracle of this movie. (laughs) But along the way, David Arquette as Danny from Angel Accounting and Whoopi Goldberg as God peep down from heaven. Miss Piggy takes a job on Scrubs, and they perform an extensive riff on the Baz Luhrmann film Moulin Rouge, starring Moulin Scrooge and Saltine. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> did, did I summarize it well? <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah, it's all to, you know. Just, just love that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a very loosely structured series of gags that are just sort of held together. Very, yeah, very loosely. And the relationship to It's a Wonderful Life is 
is pretty tenuous at best. Is, is pretty yeah. tangential. Um, it's not my favourite. Leaving aside Muppets Christmas Carol, it's still it's it's nowhere near as good as Muppets Treasure Island or Muppets okay. in Space. It's, if you say so, it's a very it's a very middling out of other Muppets. But like I say, it's like. I just I, I I like the Muppets. I like Gonzo. Yeah, I like okay. Bear. No, great. I like Statler great. and Waldorf. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's like there are so many cameos, and it's like William H. Yeah. William H. Macy turns up for about thirty seconds. Yeah, I guess he's the Joseph character. Yeah, I, I guess. Um, yeah, like the entire cast of Scrubs turn up yeah. for about two minutes. Yeah. Um. So we have yeah. So in this in this version, Kermit is George. And Miss Piggy, I guess she's supposed to be married, but she's totally not married because she's a crappy partner in this. But Fozzie is definitely, I, I, I knew right away. I was like, Kermit's going to be George and Fozzie's going to be Uncle Billy. And that was so. <laughs> I think it's really funny that there's people online who say that Kermit did 9-11 because in this movie, uh, this this movie was released shortly, uh, the year after 9-11, uh, but it was... I guess made before that. So when Kermit has his alternate reality where he's never been born, the Twin Towers are standing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't notice that. And I do have to say they they kept the fate for Miss Piggy in the alternate reality quite close to the original, where she's now a piggy cat lady. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, well, that's relatable. <laughs> but I love, the cats are like the size of the puppets. So I'm like, I'm kind of jealous. I kind of wish that I had cats that were. <laughs> <laughs> You want you really? I don't think you've thought that through, Alicia. You don't. No, <laughs> it would be miserable. Yeah. Hey, I've, I've lived with very big dogs. It's like the same thing. Okay. Um, but yeah, this version it's only about the theater. It's not about like the bigger life stuff, and it removes it removes like all the depth from the from the story. And I know it's for kids, but I, I honestly I wasn't into the Muppets as a kid either. Like a humbug, I know. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> um, you know, pe- people like what they like. They just like. What they just, I mean, I think that this is the thing. If you like the Muppets, you'll find this a, a distracting okay. 90 minutes. Yeah. And if you don't, and if you don't, you won't because no, there isn't if you much, don't, this is not the one that's going to convince you. Yeah. There isn't much of a plot to it. There isn't much of a, there, there's not the emotional stakes you get in. Yeah. You get in a Muppets Christmas Carol because the thing about Muppets Christmas Carol is it actually, it follows the Dickens story quite closely. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've also got like the, it's not snided out with cameos. And the thing is, Michael Caine absolutely commits to the bit. That's yeah. what makes that film work, is that Michael Caine plays it as though he's playing alongside other human actors. It's kind of... If you haven't yeah. seen him up at Christmas Carol, it's kind of like Bob Hoskins. I think I watched it as a kid. It's kind yeah. of like Bob Hoskins' performance in um, in uh, Roger Rabbit. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the, the, you know... That play- movie I do it, like. It's played dead straight. Like, yeah, it is a funny film, but Hoskins and Kane aren't playing for comedy. They're not yeah. looking at the audience. Um, yeah, because there are only two ways to there are only two ways to do a Muppet movie. Well, you either do the Michael Kane bit where you treat mm-hmm. all the other Muppets as if they were human, or you do the Tim Curry bit where you pretend to be a Muppet. Mm-hmm. The, okay. Yeah, there's, there's really only those. Two <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know about that, but okay. Yeah, there's really only those two ways. Of um of doing it, I don't think it's worth watching this as a movie. It's a series of sketches loosely, right. loosely mm-hmm. connected to one another. Some of them hit, some of them don't. I do like how uh, the snowman narrator in the beginning, who threatens to sue when he's kicked off, but he talks about the holiday collective consciousness. So that it sets you up for what you're about to see, where you're going to have like Rizzo the Rat with the glowing nose, and you're going to have like the creepy Who's show up, because I guess that's probably around the time that that Jim Carrey Grinch movie came out. But yeah, and this is, yeah, the late 90s jokes are just, uh, late 90s, early noughties jokes are just all over the place, like converting CDs to MP3s, God (laughs) can't use a tablet, turning off the cell phones joke, we've got Carson Daly as himself, Matthew Lillard as- Steve Irwin hunting, fuck. 
hunting for yeah. Through the streets yeah, there's quite know? there's quite an extended Steve Irwin impression that just does not work. That no. was one of the weakest words. It's very bad. Did you get the um, impression that they really wanted Steve Irwin, uh, Steve Irwin and they couldn't? Yeah. They couldn't yeah. Get it. And they were like, we're not rewriting this. Yeah. We're just going <laughs> to. Yeah. But they did have Carson Daly as himself, Matthew Lillard as Luke Fromage, Kelly Ripa shows up. Um, we have uh, Molly Shannon from Saturday Night Live shows up and references. I get she references falling in love with Kermit and him ghosting her. I guess that must be from another movie. I don't know. We get Comet the Insult Dog, who I haven't thought about since probably about that time. The Scrubs cast, as you said, and yeah, a whole bunch of other 90s stars. <laughs> I've got to re watch Scrubs at some point, see if it holds up because I absolutely loved Scrubs when it was on. When it was on yeah, Twitter. I loved Scrubs. Yeah, there's a, there's a good podcast, um, where uh, what's his face? The the oh, main Don, guy Don, and Don, Don Face. Yeah, but he says he's the second guy, and uh, Zach Braff. The, yeah, the two of them have a podcast together. Yeah, because they actually became really good friends. Didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is the first but not last rendition we'll discuss where George, uh, as Kermit, can't unwish his wish. And the moral, I don't know. I'm struggling to find the moral. So it's something about like a life without dreams is nothing. And then, you know, the Joan Cusack saying dreams ruin lives, in this case, the lives of your friends, too. But then he's shown that, no, actually, his li- their lives are worse without him. And this angel just wants to dull out justice. There's nothing about wings or a bell. No. But then they ultimately decide Kermit doesn't need revenge or justice or the theater. People just need to know what matters, whatever that is. And he opens his eyes to what he already had. So I'm like, well, okay. Yeah. I do <laughs> like the fact that, that clearly they told John Cusack, you know that performance you did in Adam's Family Values? Do that. <laughs> do that. Do that <laughs> exact that. performance. This is what we're hiring you for. Yeah. Um, you know what I love? Silo reference is when apparently in this version, the agent, if someone says, I wish I've never been born, the field agent is required to comply. So it reminded me of if someone says, I want to go outside. <laughs> <and Silo. laughs> I have to compliment in its favor. More of these movies should have a full musical number in the middle. Yes. Definitely. That's the only thing that could have made It's a Wonderful Knife better. <laughs> but why? Okay. So the angel couldn't undo the you know change in reality until he spits in kermit's eye what what was that about yeah, no i didn't i didn't get that okay and then yeah a bunch of random muppet shit um yeah it's for me it was much better once the alternate reality starts but i uh, didn't enjoy this film <laughs> is there anything else you want to shout out no 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 that's, that's pretty much covered it if you like <laughs> if you like the muppets you'll find this diverting enough if you don't you won't Okay, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. So moving on to another mess of a movie, but one that I personally enjoyed more. The Christmas Spirit, 2013, is a Hallmark movie. So in the It's a Wonderful Life tribute, the dares to ask, what if the George Barely stand-in and the evil banker fell in love? <laughs> Charlotte Hart is a journalist back in her hometown of Laurel Springs, helping her sister-in-law take care of her two kids, pretending she's only there because her brother Jerry is a soldier in the Middle East. But really, she's been fired for getting too obsessive about her stories. Jerry, it turns out, is not coming home for Christmas. But there's a new guy in town, Daniel, the real estate man. Charlotte keeps bumping into him physically and metaphorically as he tries to get all the small shops in town to sell to him, claiming it's so he can build a better town center. Charlotte is suspicious. Then they bump into each other real hard in their cars, so hard that they wind up as double coma ghosts. And luckily, Older, mysteriously reclusive neighbor Gwen, who's always been nice to Charlotte, can see the dead. And she thinks they have to do good deeds to get back in their bodies. And she teaches them how to, quote unquote, pass through, which means touching stuff. So Daniel starts giving out his money with his business card so his company gets the credit and mystically coaching his protege on how to close the deal. Meanwhile, Charlotte is investigating the deal and finds out that they're actually buying the land to knock down the town and build a highway bypass. But then she discovers that she has mystical energy powers. Plus, he helped her stop a kid from creeping on her niece, so everything is A-OK. And Daniel's all better now after celebrating Christmas for the first time ever, so they can be alive and fall in love. The end. (laughs) So, okay, Luke, obviously we have to start with your first watch thoughts. I don't know whether you want my first impressions of the Christmas spirit, but here they are. Well, it's a typical Hallmark Christmas movie. 
everybody's supposed to be struggling in this town of Laurel Falls, but it turns out everybody's living in mansions. Um, <laughs> it's largely the cast are basically composed of actors who, if given the choice between acting talent and really good hair, will reliably choose the hair every single time. <laughs> um, I think the script really confused and really confusing. Uh, I think it would have worked much better as a horror movie hmm. rather than as a sappy Christmas movie. I'd like to have seen. I'd like to have seen an exorcism at some point. <laughs> it was fun. Is about the best I can say for it. <laughs> so, is that your opinion? Is that bad movies can be improved by be- making them horror movies? No, it's just. It's just like. The entire town seems perfectly cool with having a couple of ghosts just just wandering around like she's sent she's sending emails of she's sending emails to people. Daniel <laughs> yeah. is Daniel is going around literally handing out money. By the way, does that mean is he able to like pick up physical money, put it in his But that's the passing pocket? through that Gwen taught them. Gwen taught them yeah. passing through means you can interact with the physical world. Yeah, so that's also why she not- can stop the bully from hitting her nephew. You know. Yeah, but it's it, that, 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 that's one thing. But like Daniel is Daniel is handling objects. Daniel is handling. Yeah, and like, well, so, she even says like she's like put that money away, or people just see it floating down the street. <laughs> well, that, that's what I'm saying. That's why it would work so much better as a horror movie. Like that scene <laughs> would have been so much more effective had it been seen from the point of view of the townspeople. I, you know, yeah. I wanted I wanted a mob threatening to burn down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> burn down the coals and get a penny to burn the witch. Um, the one sentence review of this is it's a Hallmark film. It's a Hallmark yeah. Christmas film. You know what you're going to get. It's done in that Hallmark kind of way, and you either go with it or you don't. Uh huh. Yeah, you either sort of enjoy, yeah. you either sort of get on board the ride and enjoy the badness yeah. and laugh at it, or you're just going to. Yeah, there's just nothing for you. So yeah, full uh, full confession. I if I had known how like off the this is I, to me this is probably the furthest away from the source material out of all the ones we're watching. So I might have put Family Man on the list instead if I had known that in advance. Um, although there are like some obvious illusions here, like Jerry the soldier brother instead of Harry. And, but Family Man, the Nicolas Cage movie, that one. Um, tackles more of the same themes so this one doesn't even have an alternate reality it's just like coma and not coma it's <laughs> not seeing your life without yourself really uh, especially because they're still interacting with the world around them even when they're force ghosts yeah <laughs> it's just the two leads have like some weird anti-chemistry it's not just that they lack, oh you think yeah it's not just that they lack I, chemistry i think it's okay each, it's not just that they lack chemistry with each other it's like they make each other's performance worse Oh, really? really I don't know. I don't see it as bad as you do. (laughs) Okay. How would you rate it out of five stars? Two and a half. Because, yeah, it's it's, it's fun to say. That's fair. I I initially gave it three and then lowered it to two and a half. Yeah. But, Uh, yeah, it's so soapy. It's so tropey. But I kind of love that about it. It's like it's a wonderful life Christmas Carol Hallmark soup mashup. But it is a mutt of tropes. But... Compared to the Muppets, I it's more the references are more timeless. Yeah, and I enjoy it more as its own thing. Like I find it more coherent. Oh, definitely, it's far more coherent than the Muppets. Um, and I don't regret including a Hallmark movie just to like cover the full range of popular horror no, no, holiday no, you've, movie you've, fair. <laughs> you've got to, you've got to put if you're going to do a holiday special, you've got to put a Hallmark movie in there. Yeah, like, um, in the UK for the whole month of December on Saturdays. Channel 5, like one of the main broadcasters, will just show those back to back to back to back yeah. the entire day <laughs> because there are so many of them. There are just well, I mean, so many of them. I, I So I, I think for a Hallmark movie, this actually isn't really bad because I watched, um, so I, I was doing for, with my film group, a advent calendar of holiday, winter holiday movies. And I had to watch one from this year's Countdown to Christmas from Hallmark. And the one that I chose was where it's called Where is Christmas? And I didn't even know until after I started watching it that it is actually also a riff on It's a Wonderful Life, where in this case, it's Christmas that's taken away. Like, what would the world be like if Christmas <laughs> were never born? 
Um, but that one was was terrible. <laughs> I think this one was better. So okay, <laughs> could be worse. But yeah, so we have Nicola Sheridan, who was you know in the peak of her Desperate Housewives fame, and they initially wanted to turn this into a series of films, but I guess that didn't work out. And then. Yeah, The Neighbor is played by Olympia Dukakis, who is just too good for this film. I'm sorry. Yeah, I remember, I don't think it referenced this particular film, but I remember reading an article a while back saying that actually Hallmark movies do a real service to veteran actors mm. because they they obviously want people like Olympia Dukakis for the name recognition. Right, name yeah. Recognition. And so they give them parts that are quite small, and they're just large enough to meet the SAG AFRA requirements for okay. allowing them to keep their their membership and their health insurance. Oh wow! Their, their health oh, insurance. That's great. So this is how this is like how Hallmark gets people like Lynn. It's kind of like a symbiotic thing. They get a right. Name, they get right. A name, it's, I mean, I'm sure it's an easy paycheck. Yeah. I'm sure it's an easy paycheck. I like to think Olympia Dukakis must have more roles, but it is true that you know. It's well known that as women uh, pass beyond 40 and beyond, uh, Hollywood's not so kind to them. With the roles. And also, the article's making the point, it's, it's a limited role. So if, if the actor is older or if the actor has health problems, this is not... It's, it's not, not a huge commitment. It's not a huge commitment. It's not too mm -hmm. too demanding of their time. It's funny, out of all the movies, so we had to talk about Christianity. This is oddly the most Christian, but the least religious. So, like, it spends time in a church, and there's, like, a pastor side character, but there's no angels and no prayers for Charlotte. Yeah, no, it's... And like I, I do, said, and like I said yeah. the whole... It's it's sort of very, very sort of war on terror, financial crisis mm. type of film. So you've got... The economy is bad, and yet everybody is living in this town in Narnia, where you know all the shops are lovely, and everybody's you know everybody's living in mansions. Uh, but yeah. we've got to honor the sacrifice of the troops, so we've got we've got Jerry away at war. It's um yeah, it's yeah. very sort of mid to late noughties. I think actually it's one of the cool things about the way you've curated these films; they're all very much of their time, right? In their That's in their true. own different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And this one, yeah, we have, you know, that, that era of like trying to be feminist, but it's it's also about the male characters being creepy to or like icky to uh, get that done. For instance, Daniel, it is she helps him with the car rather than him being the mechanic like it happened one Christmas. But then he asks her like, oh, you got a kid here? And she's like, no, a nephew. And he's like, oh, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> And he's like such a caricature of like the real estate man who he learns that he can touch the real world and he wants to call his broker. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, he's the real estate agent who cannot love. Like the whole like, there's yeah, a, there's a sort of backstory with his dad, with his dad right. who he's estranged from, and like they just needed to get the rights to put cat, a version of Cats in the Cradle in there. Because uh, exa exactly. They just paraphrased the lyrics talking about their relationship. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, the older he gets, the more he just wants to spend time together. Like, that is literally the lyrics to this song. Yeah. <laughs> and it was resolved rather quickly, but whatever. It's fine. Um, yeah, it, it, did feel like the, it did feel like this was a... There were earlier versions of this script that had the plot going off in quite different directions but yeah like, it didn't that, that stuff didn't get removed it just got shrunk um, <laughs> down to the point where you hardly noticed it maybe at one point i wondered if like daniel was just too dumb to be the villain and like his associate was the secret villain oh yeah that, cause <laughs> daniel was giving off like massive himbo energy he's yeah, not, absolutely yeah and I still don't understand why he didn't celebrate Christmas. Like they could have at least made them Jehovah's Witnesses or something to explain yeah. that. But he's like, no, I've never even seen a tree. Maybe not exactly like <laughs> that, but but at least they are equal partners here, which is one of the things I like about this story, about you know the the story framework in general. Yeah, the thing that kind of unmoors it from being a real, you know, a true, it's a wonderful life story is that. I don't get a the sense that Charlotte's really stuck as much as she's just kind of choosing this as a way to get away from her problems. And she she actually she got to live her dream and then kind of blew it. Yeah. But it's not really it's not a story about depression and regret. I don't think Charlotte regrets anything. Well, she is trying to get back on the big city newspaper. I mean, there is there is that 
Yeah. But she's lying to her family about being fired and making them think it's their fault she's there. <laughs> like, those kids are old enough to babysit themselves. So. <laughs> <laughs> and also, it's like, oh, oh, typey, 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 500 word article. Right now, I'm going to go and make, like, I'm not just going to go and make breakfast. I'm going to go and make right. super breakfast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yes, women, you can be professional, but also be good housewives as well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the movie, it's a, it's overall, it's like a love letter to small towns and local businesses because there really is a problem going on across the U.S. especially where people are buying up real estate in these small towns and the people who are from there who made it charming are, can no longer afford it. So I appreciate it. They acknowledge that. And I like to think that there is a few references to other films. So, like, referencing the original, Charlotte hits another car instead of a tree. Um, referencing Clarence, <laughs> she sees her niece skipping, like uh, like the yeah. kid did in Clarence. And also there's a lot of computer stuff, like Clarence. So, yeah, plot centering around the use of computers. And also, out of this realm, I like the decorating the tree on the tree lot reminded me of Charlie Brown. But, yeah. I don't, ultimate- I don't, think, I've, I don't think I've ever said, I, I, I'm not familiar with the reference. You've never seen a Charlie Brown Christmas? No. Oh my God. That is one of the most enduring, most iconic Christmas specials. You should definitely watch it. It's only like 20 minutes long. Okay. Okay. I'll dig it up. And there's two bad sequels, but (laughs) but the originals. Uh, I mean, bad in the way, like, I I like Charlie Brown. I like Peanuts better than I like the Muppets. So, but I I think I feel about those sequels probably the way you felt about this Muppets movie. (laughs) Okay. But yeah, this movie, ultimately, the the Christmas spirit, it's about a couple coming together rather than a town coming together to support someone who supported them, which is fine. It's a rom-com. Of course, you know, Brother Jerry shows up, like in the original movie, who needs a presidential honor? At least he's there for Christmas. But I have questions about the supernatural element added, not just like the spirits part, but this whole thing about this light in Charlotte that's so strong. And it makes, yeah, it makes Gwen wonder where she's really from. That's one of those um, things, like, I think there was an earlier version of the script where that made sense, but they, yeah. they just forgot to cut it. So I'm fine with, like, the kids can feel that their aunt is there. Fine, that makes sense. Um, but then, you know, the the niece is like, the ghost of Christmas present is Aunt Charlotte. I'm like, okay, well, how did we get there? And then <laughs> we just end with, Olympia Dukakis saying, you've taken power from the spirit world. And we find out that she's charged up the tree, even though it's not plugged in. I'm like, yeah, but, it, would, it would work so much better as a horror movie. But it's, I guess this is about like they wanted to make this a series. So I guess I was supposed to set up a, a next film. I guess. No. Speaking of horror films, we're going to move on to our last film from this series and this is where i have to issue the spoiler warning so if you haven't watched it's a wonderful knife and you don't want it to be spoiled yet then just pause right here and come back and listen once you've checked it out if you don't mind being spoiled here we go so the summary of this film is in this new slasher comedy directed by tyler mcintyre and written by michael kennedy the carruthers family is gearing up to celebrate christmas in the town of angel falls Despite dad David being overworked by his boss, Henry Waters, the real estate mogul, trying to buy up the whole town so he can turn it into Waters Cove. There's one holdout who won't sell, an old man whose house is a registered landmark, so Waters dresses up like the scream villain cosplaying as an angel and kills him, then shows up at a Christmas party to kill the guy's granddaughter and some other teens who happen to be the children of local business owners. But working together... Winnie Carruthers and her brother Jimmy kill him and unmask him. A year later, the Carruthers family is doing well, except for Winnie, who just can't get over her best friend being murdered and killing a man. Like, what's wrong with her, right? And now, and then she finds out her boyfriend is cheating on her with her friend. So she does the wish she's never been born thing. And instead of an angel, there's a too far south Aurora Borealis that answers her wish, sending her to a terrible version of her town where the stoners are now crackheads and the killings have never stopped. Her brother is dead, her aunt's wife is dead, and many more. And her mother just gets drunk and makes out with randos in front of the entire family while her dad works too much for Waters, not himself. So her mom is murdered, and she finds out that it was her dad who killed her. 
He's now doing all of the person who is now Mayor Waters murdering now. And the only person that Winnie can team up with is the girl they call Weirdo, who's actually called Bernie, an aspiring fashion designer, it turns out. Bernie figures out that the Aurora Borealis is a vengeful spirit, Waters, and decides they need to kill the killers to get Winnie back to her world. Winnie's aunt believes them for some reason and helps too. And a few deaths later, they pull it off, and Winnie realizes her boyfriend is actually better off with her friend, and she's better off with Bernie. She wakes up, thrilled to be back in her world, until she remembers Bernie, who was feeling suicidal, and she rushes to see her and save her from her self, only to find out that Bernie somehow remembers everything. Yay! The end. So, Luke, these were your initial thoughts. So I've just finished watching It's a Wonderful Knife. I really enjoyed the heck out of that. Um, it's a nice palate cleanser to Clarence. Frankly, I wish the um, the killer had turned up in Clarence and off most of the cast of that movie. But anyway, getting back to It's a Wonderful <laughs> Knife. Um, I'm usually not a huge fan of slasher movies, but I thought this one was really well done. I thought it balanced the horror and the comedy of it really well. I thought it was a really good use of all the tropes in It's a Wonderful Life. I thought it was funny. I thought it was weirdly sweet as well, which you normally don't get in slasher movies. I thought it was a really sweet ending. Um, Yeah, I really, really, really enjoyed that. Is that the same? Yeah, no, I, I really I really did enjoy it. And like I say, I wasn't expecting to. Uh, yeah. as well because this is this is just not my this is just not my genre it's not generally my jam um mm-hmm. so yeah i was i was really pleasantly surprised yeah i found the premise was surprisingly similar to the christmas the spirit of christmas yeah i think the spirit of christmas could have been done as a horror movie <laughs> yeah we got kind of like the real estate mogul taking over the town um, I have to say, I came to this movie for Joel McHale as the dad and Justin Long as the villain, but I stayed for Jane Whittup as Winnie Carruthers. They were really excellent in this. Yeah, they were abs- They were really, really good. Because like that kind of part, you know, the last female survivor in the, you know, mm-hmm. the, the tribe of the it's so easy to get that wrong. Um, and I think they played that role um, mm-hmm. intelligently. They played it with heart. They played it comedy um yeah i just thought it was a it was a really good performance also william b davis cancer man from cancer man from the (laughs) x-files yeah i mean the cast was the cast was overall really good um i thought it was interesting apparently this role winnie carruthers was written for jane widdop uh who i know them i know them from yellow jackets you don't watch yellow jackets so i guess no no i don't Yeah, and, and we also had our second villainous turn lately from Justin Long, who, you know, was always the sweetheart boy and now has lately been playing villains more, which I enjoy. Yeah, um, I'm going to say, I was, I was, I, I thought Justin Long had retired. I thought just Really? Long, what? Come on. He's, he, he's like 40. Seen, <laughs> I, yeah, but I haven't seen him in anything in ages. Uh, well, he was in Barbarian recently. And, okay. Uh, but I, I loved I loved the saying the the motto of Waters Corps was I'm the best so fuck the rest <laughs> <laughs> and his brother Buck who only takes selfies and uh, is on OnlyFans only <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but then at the end you know I have to say Buck was he seems like the douchier one but at the he's actually sad when his brother is killed you know he's like you killed my brother I should do something about that but his brother just goes and kills him in the alternate reality because yeah. he asks for a transfer to another town. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Buck looks like the jerk, but is actually, you know, he's he's the best of the henchmen of, out of all of these, I think. <laughs> I, I, I love the bit. So I'm George Bailey. Will you be my, will, will you be my Clarence? Yes. Yeah. No, that was sweet. Uh, and, and then at the end, um, so yeah, that's that's what Bernie and, and uh, Winnie say to each other. But then at the end, um, Bernie says, I wasn't Clarence, you were. And I, I just think their whole relationship so sweet. Like, it's also the realism where at one, when they're sleeping together in the theater, she's like, I couldn't sleep at all. You snore so loud. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, the romance was not in the original script, but the actors felt like they had chemistry and they wanted to, like, rep their own queer experiences. So they ended up writing the romance in. And I think 
it kind of it worked. It, it tied it together, actually. It did. It did, and I think it made, it made the ending much more impactful. It made the ending much stronger because they literally do do the, the you know the, the scene of Winnie slash George Bailey running through running through town. They do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's absolutely it's absolutely believable that Winnie would do that for to find Bernie. Um, yeah. There's also a really before the before the the reality switch. There's a really funny setup where they buy Winnie like um, athletic gear, but they buy her brother a truck. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they buy her yeah, workout clothes, which is not. It's like a pink uh, pink tracksuit, just very. As you would say in British naff. <laughs> yeah. But it's monogram but it's monogram. But it's monogram. Uh, very nineties, even though this is a twenty twenty three film. But yeah, I, I have to say Jimmy and the ants are the only people in the family who don't suck. Like her parents suck and I didn't care if they came back. Like they could have died and stayed dead for all I cared. <laughs> Especially when Winnie's looking so rough a year after her best friend's death and she kills a guy and her family's in like hard ignoral mode. Although I got mad at Bernie, too, when she, in the main reality, claimed to be protecting Winnie by lying to her about where her boyfriend is. But just for the record, like, if my partner's ever cheating on me, just tell me. <laughs> if you want to be my friend, just tell me. Yeah, um, but, I mean, in fairness, they're, like, teenagers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's the kind of stupid thing you do when you're a teenager. But, yeah, um, and also, I thought this sort of stuck by the... The rule. I think there's an informal rule with horror films of this sort of genre. You want to do it in a tight ninety minutes. You know, uh-huh. it, it moved along it like a real clip. So you yeah. didn't ha- you didn't have time to mull over the ridiculousness of the situation or like, right. Yeah, I think you're going to do that kind of film well. You have to do it with some. You have to do it with some pace. You don't mm-hmm. want to give the audience time to sort of pick holes. Right. In, True. In the world building or the plot. So but, yeah, yeah. But it's also interesting. The audience knows who the killer is the whole time. Although, yeah, there's that twist that it's dad. Although I figured that out yeah, a little bit much, before they revealed it. Yeah. yeah, but I actually thought that Bernie was going to be one of the murderers for a while because it's like because at one point I thought that it looked like one of the angel killers had boobs, but mm-hmm. maybe that was just the folding of the fabric or yeah. a stunt person. Who knows? Um, but also the whole thing about like the theater is the only thing he hasn't bought. So I'm like, oh, well, she must be in on it then. But yeah. I guess I'm glad it didn't turn out that way. I thought that like Winnie was going to have to befriend Bernie to save her from doing that because Bernie was treated so badly by everyone else. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was cool that the, there was it felt like a reference to actually to what happened one Christmas when Bernie talks about her dad catching her mom with Henry Waters. Yeah. I guess, yeah. But I, yeah, I do wonder what was up with the. Do you notice all the crowd's eyes turned green in the alternate reality when they're being transfixed by Henry oh, Waters? Yeah. So, so yeah. what are we thinking? Demonic possession? Some yeah, kind of it seems control? like it. I mean, okay. I guess they. Were, it was the same color green as the aurora borealis. So I guess yeah. it's supposed to be linked to that. And then, of course, they descend on him and destroy him. But yes, but. Did I, am I misremembering or did she, she didn't get like, she didn't get in, she got rejected from college. We know that, but that wasn't remedied at the end, was it? No, it wasn't. No, but she was just like, that's okay. (laughs) That's okay. She's found burning. It's not like a bunch of people showed up with college applications. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was, uh, do you think after discussing those six movies, do you still rank them the same way you did at the beginning? Yeah, I think I do. Um, yeah. I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna watch. It's a wonderful knife again. I think that could, yeah. that could become part of my Christmas rotation. I'm gonna try very hard never to think about Clarence ever again. <laughs> oh my um, gosh, it makes me laugh. I love it. <laughs> I'm gonna like. I, it's so I, bad. <laughs> I won't go out my way to watch It's a Wonderful Life, but if it's mm-hmm. on t- if it's on TV, I'll happily I'll happily watch it. Okay. Um, and yeah, no, I'm not going to watch the Muppets again because if I want to watch a Muppets Christmas film, I'm going to watch yeah. a Muppets Christmas Carol. Um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge that there are, of course, other films that follow this format that we haven't talked about. So, like, I know, like, the Santa Claus 3, the Escape Clause is kind of like this. Where are you Christmas? Uh, as I mentioned on Hallmark, Shrek, Shrek Forever After, uh, Back to the Future Part 3 can be argued to be based on this. 
And then, of course, I already mentioned The Family Man, the Nicolas Cage movie from 2000. And I just want to credit Necessary Range 3261 from Reddit said, yeah, The Family Man is my favorite. It's a wonderful life type movie because you wind up rooting for the life that could have been. So instead of this is how awful things would be without you, it's more of an example of there being so many different versions of what success looks like, like in life. Uh, is success being rich and having anything you want as soon as you want it? Or is success putting in years of work and sacrifice for a loving, happy family? Yeah, that, yeah that, that, that's a good point, actually. I, I, I like family, man. It's, yeah, it, it's I like it too. My, it's not on rotation at Christmas, but yeah. it's one of those films I will watch if it's, I'll watch if it's on. Um, yeah, exactly. So, I could have been on this list just as easily. Yeah. So before we finish... I just mm-hmm. wanted to ask Alicia, what's your favorite non It's a Wonderful Life Christmas movie? Um, oh gosh. You know, I, I have like these soft spots for the short specials from when I was a kid, like the Charlie Brown Christmas and also Twas the Night Before Christmas, which is a seventies uh cartoon special. I don't know. I mean, I guess there's so many racing through my head as I attempt to answer this question. Like I'm thinking about the cheesy favorites, like Love Actually and The Holiday. And uh, I do like, you know, a good uh, horror movie like uh, Violent Night or now this one's uh, It's a Wonderful Knife is being added well, to the you list. Watching, you were watching Krampus the day because it was... Yeah. Yeah. yeah Krampus is okay. <laughs> there's, okay. I think... I like the uh, Dutch version called Sint better, but it's also because the Dutch version is just like jankier and unapologetically <laughs> <laughs> B <bee> movie. <laughs> what about you? Um, so I was thinking about this and it's, it's two films that I can't separate in my head. I watch, it's tradition in my house that we watch both of these on Christmas Eve. Okay. Um, well, actually, there are three, but I'm not going to get into whether Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not. Um, <laughs> it's a Christmas movie. It takes place Christmas at a Christmas movie. party. So it's the, as the much two, of a Christmas movie, movie as It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, so the, <laughs> the, two, I, the two I have in mind are um, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Yeah, I can fair. Quote, Watch it last year. I, I can quote that film verbatim. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, that's been, that's been sort of on hard repeat on Christmas Eve in our house since, um, since we were kids. Although... Watching it last year because I thought, do I introduce my nieces to this? There's a lot more cussing in that film. Yeah, fair. <laughs> yeah, last year my my uh, friend and I, who's the same age as I am, um, we introduced it to two younger friends in their twenties, and they were very skeptical. One of them even dared malign my taste in movies in general, which, <laughs> <laughs> but but they both really liked it. <laughs> where are you going to put a Where are you going to put a tree that big, Griswold? Bend over and I'll show you. <laughs> Bend over and I'll show you. What was your other one? The, the, other other one the other one, and I know this is not a Christmas movie, so okay. don't at me, but I'm a Brit <laughs> and we don't do Thanksgiving, is, okay. train, is Trains, Trains, okay. and Automobiles. Okay. Um, because I, I really relate to Neil Page, the Steve Martin character, because I have a long, difficult journey to get home for Christmas, and I just, that film, the, the last scene in that film where they walk up to Neil Page's house and he introduces Dell to his wife, Every single time that makes me cry. Yeah. That just reliably reduces me to tears every single year. And I just, I love the scene where with the rental car. <laughs> it's just a stream of F-bombs. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can tell, I'm getting a sense of your of your holiday movie humor. Oh, because you also referenced Airplane earlier too, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I mean, that's not a holiday <laughs> film. That's just I know, it's not holiday, but it's, yeah, it sort yeah. of feels like the same genre as, yeah, as these. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I, I think, I don't know what I'm going to be watching with my family this year. We often end up watching Emmett Otter's Jug Band, which, yes, is a Muppets movie, but my mom loves it. Talk about movies that are kind of depressing, but it's also kind of a, well, it's about a family, uh, it's community coming together to pay back someone who's been good to them. So it's got a, it's a wonderful life twist to it. But I'm, yeah, I'm doing my 25 advent calendar holiday movies, and I think I'm like on number 18 now so we'll see let's if i can finish it okay next up is um next up is uh the greta gerwig little woman little women good film but next up for us in this podcast feed is uh, we're going to be breaking down beacon 23 and actually we found out thank you to fur lisa for bringing this to my attention before recording um so it turns out that they're going to release episode seven and eight on the 17th so, yeah, I guess they didn't want to release the final episode on Christmas Eve. Probably a good idea. 
So Luke and I are going to be recording a breakdown for episodes six through eight in one episode next week. And then uh, that will be up basically as soon as I can get it edited over the holidays. Uh, and, and then in January, we'll be back with the Dune series. So we're going to start with the book and then go through Hodorowsky's Dune, the Lynch movie, the sci-fi series, and talk about Villeneuve's movie and get, a, get you ready for Dune part two when that releases March 1st. And after that, the next uh, thing we're going to be tackling is the three body problem on Netflix. And in the meantime, in the book club, we're going through the silo books. So you've got Shift coming out this month, then Dust and Silo Stories next month, and then the rewatch episodes. And you can, of course, find us on Twitter and Blue Sky to share your thoughts on It's a Wonderful Life or anything else we're covering. Uh, you can find me at Alicia CB and Luke. You can find me at, at LF Midup both on um, Twitter and on Blue Sky. And just to say on my other podcast, it could be said with Will and Simon, we were doing our review of, we were doing our review of the year episode this week. I think that will be out tomorrow. Cool. Yeah. Let me listening. And um, you can also get in touch with me on the Discord for the Lorehounds, which is our parent network. And you'll find that link in the show notes. And you can also get in touch with us with any feedback or the thoughts or questions you have at woolshiftdustpodcast at gmail.com. Um, and also coming up in the Lore Hounds, we're going to have a breakdown of the Doctor Who specials, the 60th anniversary specials, and also a breakdown of the new Zack Snyder film on Netflix, Rebel Moon. And also in the MC Universe side of things, we're going to have a preview episode setting up What If, recapping season one, getting ready for season two, which we'll also be covering, and then covering Echo in January, which I'm especially excited about. And of course, there's Properly Howard. If you want funny mu uh, movie reviews with a theologian and a comedian, and um, the Properly Howard guys and the Lorehound guys have gotten together and they're doing a severance podcast. So uh, recapping season one right now, setting up to cover season two when that gets launched. And as for us, we'll see you back in this feed very soon to wrap up Beacon 23. And until then, we'll be listening for ringing bells and thinking about why we're grateful that we were born. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Who wants to start the new year with a serving of cinematic snacks? Hi, it's Alicia from Wool Shift Dust and the Lorehounds, here to tell you about the AODR Film Festival's third edition, January 4th to 24th, 61 short films across five categories, including Oscar-eligible shorts. Your votes will determine which films win the Audience Awards, and since the event takes place online, it's accessible anywhere. And with a price point of $4.99, it's also an ideal stocking stuffer for the film lovers in your life. Discover new bite-sized cinema this January. There's something for everyone, from moving documentaries on dying cultures, to avant-garde animation, to dark comedies, heart-wrenching dramedies, and everything in between and beyond. Find out more on aodr.net slash festival. That's aodr.net slash festival. See you there.